Okay, good morning. I think that we will begin. Welcome everyone to Eckstein Hall and Marquette University Law School, specifically to our Lubar Center. My name is Joseph Kearney and it's a great privilege for me as Dean of the Law School to welcome you and to provide a short introduction to today's program, Evaluating the Great Lakes Compact on its 10th anniversary. Through our Lubar Center, we offer any number of programs. There are a greater number of important topics, of course, than we can cover. So it may be appropriate to note three things, three events, if you will, that together helped occasion our focus on today's topic. The first happened 10 years ago tomorrow. Specifically, the President of the United States, George W. Bush, signed a bill from Congress creating the Great Lakes Compact. This had been long in the making, but I will note that three years previously, right here in Milwaukee, the eight Great Lakes governors had signed the proposed compact. The hope was that the compact would revolutionize interstate water policy and secure the availability of a critical resource for generations to come. It would do this in a number of ways. They included prioritizing sustainable use of the basin's waters for economic development and environmental protection, generally prohibiting diversions of water outside the basin, and bringing predictability and stability to the process and standards that govern exceptions to the ban on diversions. This brings me to the law school's particular interest in this matter, the second event, if you will. Around that same time, 2008, the law school, like a number of other entities in Milwaukee, academic, nonprofit, and corporate, began to place increased emphasis on water, including how we might make a contribution to the region's developing focus on becoming a worldwide water hub. We did this on an ad hoc basis for a number of years until what we regard as the big move. In 2015, we appointed David Strifling, a Marquette engineer and Marquette lawyer with an additional law degree from Harvard, as director of an expanded water law and policy initiative. The effort has been to position the law school and the university more generally as a leading center for the exploration of water law and policy issues. Part of the water law and policy initiative mission is public education as reflected, in fact, in the longer name of the Lubar Center, the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. Toward that end, in the past couple of years, the law school has hosted numerous water-related events that have touched on the Great Lakes Compact in one way or another. To mention only the most recent, this past spring, we hosted a conference dedicated to water policy in the Chicago megacity. The third event has not quite happened yet. One of our guests today, noted author Peter Annan, is about to release a revised edition of his Great Lakes Water Wars. This is one of the most influential books ever written about the Great Lakes, especially when it comes to the compact and water policy. The release, no coincidence, is this week. Mr. Annan is a new friend. We knew of him previously, but we met him only earlier this year when he delivered the keynote address at that Chicago megacity conference that I mentioned a moment ago. He will play an important role in this conference, whose purpose, it is true, includes commemorating the compact's anniversary, but we will also do our best to evaluate whether the compact has fulfilled its promise. Over the first decade, things have not folded, unfolded exactly as the framers of the compact anticipated. And as it happens, southeastern Wisconsin has proved to be a hot spot of Great Lakes water controversies. Old friends are good too, and we will start with one today, the Honorable Jim Doyle. Mr. Doyle is especially well positioned to voice an opinion to help educate us on the matter at hand. For he was one of the compact's architects, it's not too much to say. He did this in his capacity as the 44th governor of Wisconsin from 2003 to 2011. Before his election, he served 12 years as the state's attorney general. Just to trace it back further, he received his undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin and his JD from Harvard Law School. 
And to sketch it out forward, since leaving public office, Governor Doyle has served as of counsel to the law firm Foley and Lardner with a particular emphasis on strategic advice and counsel to clients in highly regulated industries. But it is, to be sure, Mr. Doyle's work as governor that gives him a particular grounding, even expertise here. I don't mean his remarks upon my invitation at Marquette Law School's graduation ceremony in 2008, although I do recall those as having been especially generous. Rather, as the chair of the Council of the Great Lakes Governors, Governor Doyle played a critical role in negotiating the agreement on the Great Lakes Compact. We have invited him to reflect on both the history leading to the compact and on how successful, in his estimation, the compact has been. After his remarks, time permitting, we will take a few questions, after which I will yield to Professor David Strifling, whom I have already mentioned and who will be in charge from there. Please, welcoming, please join me in welcoming to Marquette Law School's Lou Bar Center, the Honorable Jim Doyle. Thank you, Dean. Well, good morning. Thank you, uh, Dean, for the kind introduction. I want to compliment you and Marquette and the Lou Bar Center, Mike Goucher, the whole team. I've watched this uh, public policy emphasis develop over the years, and it has really become a center for important discussions in the state of Wisconsin, in this region, and in this country, and I, I thank you for that. It was visionary, and it has really uh, been important to the whole state. Uh, I am really pleased to be here on the 10th anniversary of a, a really hallmark moment in the history of the Great Lakes when President Bush signed the Great Lakes Compact. And, um, you know, I'm asked, uh, is it successful or not? And I will say to you, that test is really still to come in the future when the demands for water grow and grow and grow around uh, the United States, around the world, and the eyes of those who want water get focused on this amazing resource. You know, keep in mind, it seems so natural to us now that we would be working to protect Great Lakes water. It was only in the, it was in the 1980s that a Wisconsin governor actually, somewhat jokingly, in fairness to Governor Dreyfus, but nevertheless, talked about how important, how oil, this is at a time when the oil, uh, when, when OPEC was at its uh, peak and the shortages were there, and he jokingly, well, somewhat jokingly, but it's a serious moment, said, you know, water will be the oil, and we ought to think about how do we sell the water of the Great Lakes. Uh, so it, 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 we now sort of take it for granted that this is something that we would protect. But I think as you look at how this developed and where the compact came from, it came from a, a real fear that I think is still legitimate and will be out there in decades to come of people looking to do to these lakes what happened to the Aral Sea uh, and other places in the world. So um, it, is a, it was a, a significantly large accomplishment, and it really has two main port parts of it that, from my perspective, were critical. One that received and continues to receive a lot of uh, attention, which is diversion. But I think perhaps even more importantly was that this was a framework for the joint management of these lakes that instead of uh, Wisconsin DNR and the Michigan DNR and the Ohio going their own ways and trying to figure out what to do, that this was the framework by which data would be collected and the science behind Great Lakes preservation would be done uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, that it, it was uh, in cooperation of all of those states and the federal government. It's an incredibly important part of what this was about. And I would assume as you talk today, part of the discussion I hope will be on how effective that part of the compact uh, has been. Because to my mind, I'll talk about it in a moment, uh, I think that that's one that we, we have not adequately picked up on. To some degree we have, but not adequately, and one that really has to be addressed in the future. Let me turn a little to the history of this. And, my world is political, uh, at the, was at the time at least. 
Uh, and I saw a lot of wonderful people, some of whom are here in the room today and others around the state, who were really working hard at what the basic, uh, at the basic science of this was and the basic technical uh, work that had to be done in order to put this together. Uh, I don't know about above all of that, but at the same time as all of that was some really major political uh, uh, forces that were at work. And only when those forces came together in a very particular, in a very unique kind of way were we in a position to get this passed through eight states and the Congress of the United States. So there had been a lot of talk about, um, as I say, big picture, about the potential threat of people taking water from the Great Lakes. Uh, and, it, but, and also, uh, all of the Great Lakes states understood the importance, but Wisconsin maybe, I would argue, since the Upper Peninsula really should be part of Wisconsin, we have more Great Lakes frontage than anyone else. Um, but ceding that to Michigan, we're at least number two in the amount of actual uh, Great Lakes uh, uh, um, uh, exposure that we have. And for Wisconsin, our history, our culture, our economy, where, our, uh, where we have come from is all tied up in the Great Lakes. I've always loved the picture from outer space of the planet. And Wisconsin is one of the states you can actually say there's Wisconsin. And the reason you can is because of water, because of Lake Superior on the north and, lakes, and Lake Michigan on the east and the Mississippi River on the west. Now that Illinois border is, is made up, but the others are, <laughs> by the way, you know why Chicago is in Illinois was when Illinois came into the Union, they needed some, um, the idea, all states coming in at that time needed some Great Lakes exposure since that was the way, needed Great Lakes ports since that's the way everything happened. And that's why Illinois, when their admission got this little sliver of Great Lakes, which is 60 miles at the bottom of the river and we, at the bottom of the lake, and we've seen what's happened with that. Similarly, Minnesota, many of you may know this history, but uh, should follow the Mississippi. And at least the eastern part of St. Paul should be in the state of Wisconsin. But in order to give them Great Lakes, uh, Great Lakes Port in Duluth, they went up the St. Croix River, and that's why they, uh, that's, so Wisconsin should be all the way from Chicago to the Twin Cities. <laughs> but generally speaking, we're defined by the Great Lakes. And it is where our, uh, our economy grew in the 19th century. It is where the great cities grew. This one in particular uh, was along this lake. It was critical to us. And it cont continues to be critical to our politics. But, and here's where the politics comes in. When Wisconsin was laying out its political boundaries, nobody was thinking about where the mini continental divide was. Nobody was thinking that the lake, that the divide on the watershed, the Great Lakes Basin was only whatever it is, Peter, six, seven miles uh, west of the shores of Lake Michigan. Nobody in those communities that were within 25 miles or so of Lake Michigan did not see them, they all saw themselves, I should say, as Great Lakes communities. It just wasn't something that when people were thinking where the counties should go and where political boundaries should go and where cities should be located, it wasn't, to my knowledge, in anybody's thinking to say, you know, New Berlin, we wanted to have a city, but only put a little bit of it into the uh, uh, Great Lakes Basin and the rest, they can all look to the Mississippi and to the west for their water. So now we're facing the practical reality of how do you get a Great Lakes Compact passed in a political structure in which there is a, a quite legitimately a lot of um, concern about how this is all going to work. Now, that was one really significant problem we have and continue to have. And when you talk about the issue of diversion in southeast Wisconsin, that's not because people are more cantankerous in southeast Wisconsin. It's because there are communities that have long seen themselves as Great Lakes communities that may be a mile or two or three to the west of the Great Lakes Basin. And that's the geography of this. So I've heard some to talk about this issue say this wasn't so much about partisan politics, it was about 
where that, where that divide happened to come through when we became so focused on what's in the basin and what isn't in the basin. So that obviously had to be worked out, and it had to be worked out in a way that hopefully in the long run wasn't going to make everybody happy, but had, uh, had political solutions that were there. The main one being any water coming out in the so-called straddling communities, I assume you're going to talk about today, had to go back in, had to be treated and go back in. The second big challenge that we had is one that continues to plague our politics today. And I'm going to be a little partisan here, so I apologize to my Republican friends out there. But at the time, the Great Lakes Compact was seen by much of the Republican Party in Wisconsin, Republican legislators, I should say, as sort of do-gooder, liberal, green, democratic policy. And with a Democratic governor pushing it as hard as I was pushing it, that is just something, you know, you, there's kind of an instinctive thing is we're not there. We're, we're, this is too much regulation. This is too much government interference. The market, you can hear all of the arguments. The market will take place of it. And then there was a very practical Republican opposition to it, which was that the Republicans largely represented the communities that needed to deal with the straddling community uh, uh, issue, which was a really significant issue. If I represented Waukesha, Waukesha County, Democrat or Republican, I'd better be trying to make sure that I don't have radium in the water and that I have a source of water and that I'm working on those kinds of issues. So there was real legitimate, uh, there, there, I shouldn't call the first one uh, illegitimate, there was the sort of general anti-regulatory issue and then there was the very particular issue of what do we do in what are largely Republican communities uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that are, are just outside of the basin. Then there were the usual kinds of issues that were there as well. Um, environmentalists demanding everything to be 100% correct. Business, uh, business people saying, uh, some business people saying this is going to be terrible for our business. And, trying to get them uh, uh, to somewhere together. I am really amazed at the number of great people, both parties, business, environmentalists, who actually understood in the end what the practicalities of this were and how much they had, how they had to get down and work together. And that is what resulted ultimately in a decision being made uh, in favor of the Great Lakes Compact in Wisconsin. Uh, our, our approval of this compact was absolutely critical. Uh, Peter's written uh, and has written the, the definitive history of this. Uh, but we really had been a key state. Uh, our, it was our negotiators that were at the center. I see David Nafsker here, who was the, uh, the, the director of the Council of Great Lakes Governors, who uh, I was chair, uh, chair uh, following Governor Taft. So we had two governors that had really been pushing this. There was a lot of very difficult negotiations that had to be done in order to get eight different states with eight different uh, uh, places together. And because of Wisconsin's lead role in this, it was critical. Um, Michigan's pretty easy. Obviously, they have the most, if you give them the UP, they have the most frontage. But for them, they have one little tiny corner of the state that uh, is outside the Great Lakes Basin. So their, their politics are pretty simple. If you're a Democratic uh, uh, official or a Republican official in, Mix in Michigan, you're against Great Lakes diversion. There's no reason for you not to be, and it's a very, very popular position to have. So we had to, we had to get every state uh, in agreement, and Wisconsin was critical. Now, we were really tied up in this. I've, I was in fighting this for several years before we, we ultimately passed it. And I would say there are two big things that led to its passage. One was that the Waukesha people understood in the end, it took a couple of years for this to happen, but they understood in the end that DNR, and this was something I supported completely, was not going to let them off the hook on the radium in the water. That as a practical matter, they needed to deal with their water source and that the Great Lakes was the only place they, in, in realistic terms that they could turn to, and that the, the, I wouldn't call it the Wild West, but the largely unstructured 
uh, process that existed before the compact, which was just you put out a request, and if any governor says no, they, that wasn't going to work for them. And in the end, they understood that only through a organized process like the Great Lakes Compact could they legitimately at some point get approval from the other governors of the, of the Great Lakes states in order to get the diversion. Now that took a while, and I don't really blame them because I understand you're always in politics and fighting to figure out how to do this the easiest way and so on, but at, 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 a, at, a, at a, the point before this passed, Waukesha recognized that this was the way that uh, they had to go. Um, uh, and, and so at that point, the Republican opposition in the state became very different because when Waukesha Republicans start telling the Republican legislator what needs to happen, it somehow I've figured out it sort of starts to happen at that point. Uh, so that, uh, th that, that change was very, very important. And then in addition, um, a number of other states started passing this. The Republicans in Ohio and the Republicans in Wisconsin had a nice little confab going between the two and were generally in opposition and, and were making sure that it was in opposition. But because of what happened in Waukesha, the Wisconsin Republicans changed. We had been talking to them, I also ought to say. I mean, one of the good things about this was we had been talking to Republican legislators for two years, not in a big antagonistic kind of way, but just continuing to talk, to inform them on what was going on, to try to include them in everything that was happening. And you know, patience like that sometimes pays off in the end. So we did, when the moment came that the Republicans were moving to the other side, we weren't starting from scratch. We had a number of good Republican legislators who had been be basically sort of understanding and behind this for a long time that were ready to go. Uh, and when Wisconsin went, Ohio had to go. And when Wisconsin and Ohio were there, then it all happened. David Nafsker, I, I noticed, was quoted in Peter's book as saying, what happened then in Congress was the war that never happened. Uh, we had always been assuming that we were going to be in for a big fight with the arid states looking at us. A couple of problems. One is those western states had actually, they were the ones that had led the way in big water compacts. So they kind of had to support ours. They had divided up the Colorado River. They'd done all kinds of things through, uh, through these compacts. So they had to be with us. And second, it just wasn't that big an issue right then. I still believe this will be a big issue 10, 20, 25 years from now. And that's why I think that the real success of the compact has yet to be tested. What will really test this at some point is when there is a huge water shortage demand in the country and people go to Congress and say, you've got to get rid of this compact in order for us to have it. Here are the challenges that I see ahead. Um, one is, uh, since 2010, there has been a real change, and there certainly has been in the last couple of years, in the politics of how people see regulation versus government involvement. And there's just no doubt. Anybody can look at it. I can be critical of it. Other people can applaud it. But we have moved into a era in which non-regulation, uh, over-government involvement is, uh, has been a winning political message uh, in election after election. And I think that that has seriously slowed us down in Wisconsin and slowed out down the other Great Lakes states in really taking care of what, as I mentioned at the outset, is a critical part of this is what, how do we really get the states to work together? There's a lot of good work being done, I know. Uh, whether it's at the level and the intensity that I would like it, probably not so much. But there is a lot of work that continues to be done, and it is the framework that we really have to make sure gets, uh, that, that gets built. Uh, and the second um, is the Great Lakes, this is sort of the success of the compact, the Great Lakes has, a, has, to me, when I looked at it, has back, the compact has sort of taken the impetus out of Save the Great Lakes political fervor. And I have not, I don't follow them all, but I have not seen uh, other state elections in Wisconsin or other places really bring this issue to the fore in for many years. And I think it has just receded some in the public mind. And I think it's critical, we're in a governor's campaign now and other times, to really test candidates on 
How committed are they to this compact and to this process? And more importantly, what kind of resources are they willing to put in to the effort to make sure that this happens? So those are some of my thoughts on where we have been and where we are going. And I understand there are a few minutes for questions. Thank you. They told me they're really harsh on the time limits here, so that's why I, I ran into it. <laughs> you got us back on track, so I'm very grateful. Uh, we were uncharacteristically uh, running late. Uh, so uh, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions, and if you can raise your hand, I will recognize you. The governor, having been governor, is actually more likely to recognize you, um, uh, but I will call on you. Yes, Don. Uh, Governor, great to have you here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good seeing um, you. What was the involvement of the Canadian provinces in the process of putting this all together? Uh, they were deeply involved. Uh, uh, Ontario in particular. In fact, at the, when we signed the compact, the Premier of Ontario was here, Darren McGuinty. Uh, Manitoba has been involved in a lot of water issues with us. Quebec, uh, one of the great things of Great Lakes politics is we had several conferences in Quebec City, which was uh, a good place to, to go and visit. They let you stay in the big hotel and everything, you know, and so it was, uh, but they were, and, and you know, good to my judgment, politically, it's really good to have the Canadians in these things because they've got, uh, they have a much more conservationist uh, view of these lakes than we do, and it was really important to have that that, um, that voice in the whole discussion. I'm going to do something I almost never do, which is to uh, assert whatever prerogatives I have and ask a question myself. Um, how hard was Illinois in this process, or was it simply a matter of assuring it that the Chicago diversion would be grandfathered? Peter, you, my memory is Illinois was never one of the sticky states, and it basically had to do that they would be grandfathered. They may have been the second state that passed it in the end. Now, they had a, is that right, David and Peter? They had, uh, it's always easier when you're dealing with one party to kind of work through some of these issues. So they had a, a Democratic governor, Pat Quinn, who had actually been, when he was lieutenant governor, chair of a very similar organization of, uh, dealing with Great Lakes issues. So... Uh, they were there, and uh, once they, you know, we're going to, should, and continue to be hard with them on dealing with invasive species and what they do with the river, but when they knew we weren't going to make them turn the river back around, I think it became fairly easy for them. Other questions? Yes. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, engineering is going to be addressed later and the uh, political aspects of it. What if any uh, financial issues were involved? Well, uh, the, the biggest were how much the federal government was going to include. And these come up in every single budget on what is that budget going to be. Uh, and the Bush administration uh, at the end made a very significant commitment to this. And the first Obama budget, which you may recall, was the stimulus, so it was kind of a time of let's go out and spend money was very good. It's been pretty tough going uh, since those on making sure that we've been, the budget's been adequate. We don't want to undo the substantive good that you did for us um, by getting us uh, back on schedule, so I think we are going to if I recall the schedule correctly, proceed to the uh, next item on the agenda. Are you going to introduce that, Dave? Okay, terrific. Governor, we are immensely grateful that you would come here and not only Thank share you. old times, but look forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Doyle and Dean Kearney. And good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Strifling, Director of the Water Law and Policy Initiative here at the Law School. And I'm very pleased now to introduce the next part of our program. Peter Annan is a veteran author and journalist who, as Dean Kearney said, is about to launch a new version of one of the most influential books ever written about Great Lakes water policy, Great Lakes Water Wars. From Chicago to Waukesha to Foxconn and beyond, it is a landmark account of the hard-fought battles over this precious resource. Peter is also the director of the Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation at Northland 
College near the shores of Lake Superior in Ashland, Wisconsin. We're very fortunate to have him here with us to tell us more of the story. With Peter for this conversation will be Mike Goucher, who is our Distinguished Fellow in Law and Public Policy here at the Law School. And I'll turn it over to Mike from here. Dave, thanks very much. And uh, thanks to Peter Annan for coming back to Marquette Law School. Good to have you here back in Milwaukee. Appreciate Good to be here. You. Appreciate you making the drive down. We're going to talk a, a bit about Peter's revised book. First of all, let me uh, ask you when you made that decision that you needed to write sort of a new version of the Great Lakes Water Wars. Yeah, well, following the Waukesha, and we have great representation here from Waukesha today, um, following having a chapter on Waukesha in the original version, right. uh, I was waiting for the Waukesha decision to uh, be finalized before I worked or published the second version. And I don't think anybody in this room figured it would take as long as it <laughs> did for the Waukesha decision to happen, five years of review at the DNR, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and in that time, a lot of other things happened in the Great so. Lakes region, so uh, I added those to the book as well. well. Well, let me begin maybe with the big question, and Governor Doyle brought this up in his remarks. He said the people in, in uh, the Great Lakes Basin still had this real, he referred to it as legitimate fear that people are eyeing our water, that they still want to tap into our water. Has the Great Lakes Compact, as you understand it, based on the, the reporting you've done, has the Great Lakes compact adequately address that issue? Yeah, I, I think the lakes have never been better protected from long-range, large-scale diversions as they are now. And that was the driving force, as the governor said, you know, to, to have a legal water fence surrounding the Great Lakes Basin to keep Great Lakes water inside the watershed for the environment, the economy, and the people who live here, and to have the jobs come to the water rather than send the water to the jobs. You've got a lot of different uh, people who are interested in how the compact would work. You've got business and agricultural interests. You've got environmentalists. You've got everyday citizens, people like us who just live in the region. Who's been happiest about the way the compact has worked? And are there people who are legitimately unhappy about the way it's worked? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that the, the, the champions, which were, you know, very diverse uh, of the Great Lakes Compact, are happiest that it is in place. And, uh, but with complex environmental legislation like this, there are always those who had wished to see more and the way the implementation has happened in, in different uh, examples uh, is definitely... Uh, it's a hot button issue, and there's a lot of emotion uh, surrounding it, and because you know the, the region is defined geographically, economically, environmentally, and industrially by this these these water bodies, which are very charismatic, and uh, that resonates with a lot of people. Yeah, it was interesting in the book. Peter writes that uh, um, a lot has changed in the last decade or so since uh, the years when you were writing the original book. But one thing that hasn't changed, I think you say, is the, the visceral nature of the water diversion controversy. That has not changed. Yeah, and I think one of the, one of the surprises for me is that I think that, that I thought that the compact might sort of chill out uh, the debate. Uh, and in fact, I think a lot of us in the room feel like it maybe even has ramped up uh, a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's been a bit of a surprise. It's just that that, that, that emotion, that power, powerful emotion that people feel towards the water um, is, is still there and as robust as ever. You say the water diversion issues are more complex today. How so? Well, I think, you know, the exception clauses that the governor referred to, the straddling county exception clause, the straddling community exception clauses are really complicated. And that's sort of where the rubber has been meeting the road on the, comp on the compacts uh, implementation. And I think, you know, when you have a lot of emotion, sometimes the complexities can be lost in the emotion uh, on, on all sides. And I think it's really important that people channel that emotion into really studying the issues and understanding the complexities and, and the nuances. And, the, you know, voices need to be heard, but, um, but it's important to really understand the complexities of the exception clauses and why they're in there. And, you know, we're going to see more and more uh, water diversion applications, these return flow water diversion applications, and that was the idea behind the compact and those exception clauses. So, Can you take a couple minutes, Peter, and, and walk us through? I mean, some people in this room will know this, some people may not, but walk us through a couple of the more complex parts of the compact. We're talking about straddling communities, straddling counties. 
help us better understand what the compact says about both of those and the possibility of diversions being granted to communities. Yeah, so when the compact's authors, some of whom are, are in the room, were uh, uh, sitting down to, to deciding sort of where to draw the line legally is that you know, they have some communities, some in southeastern Wisconsin, New Berlin being the most famous example, um, that literally straddled the basin line. In the case of New Berlin, before the compact was adopted, part of town, the eastern part of town, was inside the Great Lakes Basin drinking beautiful Lake Michigan water. Walk across the street to the central part of town, and residents there were drinking treated, but the source water was naturally contaminated, uh, contaminated groundwater. And so the, the DNR and local uh, you know, water utility officials in New Berlin were struggling with this bifurcated plumbing system in the city uh, because of this, the, the basin line being this, this line in the sand and, 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 and the complexities of getting water to that other side of town. And so what the compact did is it created this straddling community exception clause that allowed communities like New Berlin to apply for water, to divert water to that other part of town just beyond the basin and then return that water back to the Great Lakes after it's used, uh, you know, treating that water to Clean Water Act standards, proving that there'd be no adverse environmental impacts, uh, et cetera, and also having a strict uh, conservation program. Straddling counties, different? Yeah, and so the key difference there is that, that, is that with the straddling community exception clause under the Great Lakes Compact, just the local governor and DNR are the ones who approve those uh, uh, water diversion applications. Stradling County uh, situation was a more controversial aspect of the Great Lakes Compact to begin with, and that dealt with counties that straddled the Great Lakes Basin Line, and communities within those counties, like Waukesha, have, a, have an opportunity to apply for a Great Lakes water diversion, again, agreeing to return the water, no reasonable water supply alternatives, conservation program, et cetera. But because the community itself is clean and clear outside the Great Lakes Basin, a straddling county applicant requires the approval of all eight Great Lakes governors from Minnesota to New York, so a much, much higher bar. And that's why we saw so much uh, time put into the Waukesha application. And, and, that, and again, that's a more controversial aspect of the compact generally, and had 11,000 comments mostly opposed to Waukesha during that time period. I, I want to spend some time on, on uh, diversions that have occurred uh, in the history of the compact. And you've mentioned two of them, and we'll, we'll go in a little bit more depth here. Uh, first of all, New Berlin, because New Berlin, on, on the surface, I think would seem to a lot of people, this would be a no-brainer, this would be easy, or right next, as Peter explained, <laughs> part of New Berlin has great, clear Lake Michigan water, and the other part has serious problems with its water. This is what the compact was designed to do. And yet it wasn't that simple. No, it wasn't. And and again, you know, Michigan has, Michigan's the Great Lakes state, and it's always felt probably the most productive, if you will, about Great Lakes water. And, and uh, uh, it was, you know, New Berlin was being pursued during a gubernatorial election in Michigan, which is a particularly difficult time to have anybody endorse any kind of a water diversion proposal. And so, yeah, the Wisconsin DNR was having a hard time uh, working with uh, uh, Michigan on, uh, uh, any kind of endorsement or agreement on, on the New Berlin uh, water diversion proposal, and it got quite hot between the two states in particular with dueling press releases, and, and the Attorney General, also up for election in Michigan, was uh, heavily involved, and the Governor and the Attorney General kind of out-positioning themselves to criticize the New Berlin water diversion at the time. And, and uh, yeah, really interesting time, and it's, 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 it is truly the compact's first test case. Uh, Waukesha has since overshadowed it, so that's why I call it sort of the forgotten, forgotten. Uh, water diversion in, mm. in the Great Lakes region. Yeah. There's a funny story in the book. Peter talks about uh, Jennifer Granholm, who I think was then the Democratic candidate yeah. for governor. Um, uh, her staff got wind that this uh, diversion was being at least thought about and contemplated. Boom, all of a sudden it's in the news, because in Michigan, it doesn't play. Water diversions do not play. Yeah. Almost a non-starter. Yeah, there's, there, there was an era in Michigan when the state of the governor would have the state of the state address, and then he or she would sort of pound the podium as one of their classic sort of bullet points and say, Great Lakes water will never be diverted from the Great Lakes under my watch, so help me God, and then they have this fight. 
you know, bipartisan <laughs> standing ovation there. So, um, so getting getting the citizens of Michigan to sort of embrace this idea under the compact that some of these diversions uh, were not only endorsed by the compact, but you know, uh, were were you know specifically meant to be allowed to happen. Uh, was a was a sort of a long-term hard sell in the in the state of Michigan, and uh, and that gets back a little bit to I think sort of the, you know, there's a lot of heart in 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 the in the debate, and and I think it's important to dig deeper, send that energy deeper into the the weeds a bit, and and understand some of the technicalities. Let's talk about Waukesha in in some uh, detail now, uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, it's good to have you with us today, Mayor Riley from Waukesha, um, who is sort of on the back end of this, we should say. Um, but Waukesha knew it, it had water problems in the early 2000s. It was very clear that something had to be done. But the application for the diversion, uh, request for the diversion, didn't happen until 2010. It wasn't resolved until, I think, 2016. Uh, you have called Waukesha's diversion the most contro controversial diversion uh, in our time. Uh, certainly in the 21st century. Why do you say that? What made it so controversial? Yeah, well again, first of all, the Stradling County Clause was a very debated clause in the compact. And then uh, secondly, you know, during the compact negotiations, the Stradling County Clause is often sort of referred to informally as sort of the Waukesha Clause by some people. Because uh, it was, you know, quite clear to most of us that Waukesha would be the first Stradling County applicant uh, once the compact was adopted. Uh, and and so, the, and, but it was also that first test case. You know, New Berlin the first test case at Stradling Community, Waukesha first test case at Stradling County, uh, and, uh, and 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 then all sorts of other geopolitical things. You know, you've got Milwaukee being sort of a Democratic stronghold, Waukesha, you know, uh, uh, more of a Republican, the county more of a, a Republican stronghold. So there are all these, uh, you know multi-layered issues that sort of helped uh, create this sort of polarization that, that followed Waukesha. And then I just think also the duration, you know, it just kept going on and on and on and people became more entrenched on, on all sides. And uh, uh, it, it was, you know, I went through, I think there are three different mayors and, you know, sort of were in office from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end of the Waukesha uh, situation. So. Uh, it, there's a lot there, which is why there's two chapters on Waukesha in the book. So um, there's a lot, a lot there, as, as many people in the room know. Many, there's a lot of people in here who know a lot about Waukesha in particular, opponents, supporters, et cetera. Why do you think it took six years? Well, I think it was, you know, I think the DNR uh, wanted to get it right because of that first test case for, for this. Um, and, 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 you know, and then it just, there was, there was a lot of arm wrestling between the DNR and Waukesha on how the application should be. There's no prototype to go off of. Um, and, uh, and in the end, you know, Dan Dukniak and I were, you know, the water, water utility manager and I were trying to figure out just, was it really 3,000 pages or was it 2,500 or was it 4,000 pages? But it is, it's got to be one of the, the largest water applications in the history of the nation. So that takes a long time just to compile those various documents. So ultimately, uh, the governors signed off on this. It was approved. Uh, and yet there are still some people who were not happy about it. Uh, what specifically were they still concerned about? Yeah, well, there were a number of concerns, and Dave Ulrich is here, former executive director of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, and they were one of the, the leading um, uh, complainants, if you will, about the, the Waukesha decision. Uh, there were a number of problems. So there, there was only one official hearing in, in the Waukesha case that was run by the Great Lakes uh, and St. Lawrence governors and premiers, and that was in Waukesha, and there was a lot of interest in having a more robust uh, public hearing process. The state of Minnesota held its own hearing on its own. The state of Michigan held a couple of hearings. Uh, but there was a, a, a belief that there should have been more um, public involvement or encouragement in, in the process. Um, and then there was just, the, just a lot of discussion and debate about uh, you know, Waukesha's application was, was pared down by the regional body and the compact council from 10.1 million gallons to, per day to 8.2 million gallons per day. Um, and the geography of the, the of the diversion, how far the water would be would distributed, uh, was cut by more than 50% by the governors as well. But sort of how that happened, and how the public process 
was was involved there was a big part of it. And um, you know, again, I'm trying to stay out of the weeds here. There's a lot of weed stuff on the and the, the disagreements. And I think we'll hear from Dave uh, later today. And I think he'll be a better um, he'll do a better job of describing exactly uh, his organization's uh, disgruntlement. But there was a time. Uh, they, so they, the, the mayors appealed uh, the decision. The governors, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, ruled against the appeal. And there was a time when it looked as though the Great Lakes mayors were going to sue the Great Lakes governors over the Waukesha decision, which would, would have really been a historic uh, moment and, and, and you know, arguably not a great start to uh, the first test case of a Stradling County application. The issue of this being precedent that I assume for some people is still very much first and, and front and center in their minds anyhow, that, that this would set a precedent. There would be other communities all around the Great Lakes Basin. They would say, Waukesha did it. We should do it. Yeah, and this whole issue from the very beginning has always been about precedent. And, and uh, you know, there's a Nova, Nova group proposal out of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario in 1998 to ship 158 million gallons of Lake Superior water to Asia to try to create a bottled water market, global bottled water market for uh, Lake Superior water. And that's really was the big final, you know, mm -hmm. example of what uh, the region didn't want to have happen that pushed the compact through. 158 million gallons sounds like a lot, but it's nothing in compared to the whatever it is, three quadrillion gallons in, in Lake Superior. So it was the precedent of that that was so alarming to people. And Waukesha's 8.2 million gallons per day is also not a lot of water in the grand scheme of things, but it's the precedent that it could potentially set. And there's been a lot of confusion about that precedent as well, and that Waukesha's water diversion approval only sets precedent for other straddling county applicants mm -hmm. in the future. It does not open the door to long-range, large-scale diversions in the future. That is the difference that the Great Lakes Compact brought to the conversation. If you're not in a straddling community, and if you're not in a straddling county, you can't even request a Great Lakes water diversion. You can't, you don't even have standing to make a request like that. So therefore, a straddling county application like Waukesha's does not set precedent for anything other than other future potential straddling county applicants. I want to talk a little bit about the future, and, or maybe current events and the future. And I, let's spend some time on Foxconn, uh, which is an interesting case in itself. Um, Perhaps you can uh, give us some insight into what the request is. Uh, obviously, Foxconn needs a lot of water to do the kind of, of uh, work that it wants to do in Mount Pleasant, uh, which is in Racine County. Um, they have to find that water somewhere. Give us a, a sense, Peter, of, of, of what they're asking for and why some are concerned about the request. Yeah, so again, we're in southeast Wisconsin. Most people know the Foxconn situation, you know, cold, but, you know, $10 billion proposal, 13,000 jobs from the 27th largest company in the world uh, to build a facility the size of three Pentagons uh, in, uh, in Mount Pleasant, as you said, just west of Racine. Uh, and in sort of a, a situation that the authors of the compact told me that they didn't ever really envision is this giant facility itself happens to straddle the Great Lakes Basin line. So we sort of have a straddling corporation within a straddling community. You said actually their, their big uh, facility is split in half right. by the line of the Great Lakes Basin. Yeah. As one of uh, Governor Walker's officials put it to me in the reporting in the book, he said it's quite possible that those flat screens will start in the Mississippi River watershed and end up in a box in the Great Lakes watershed. Um, and so that means that, you know, they're, they're, since they're straddling, that they, you know, and they need, they, the overall request is 7 million gallons per day, so a little bit smaller than Waukesha, 5.8 million to go to Foxconn, uh, is that there needed to be an application for a water diversion to that uh, far southwest corner of Mount Pleasant. And, uh, and so Mount Pleasant, uniquely or interestingly, doesn't have its own water supply system. It actually gets its water from Racine. And so Foxconn needed Mount Pleasant to apply, and Mount Pleasant needed Racine to apply, which is why Racine has applied for the water diversion on behalf of Foxconn. Um, and that uh, application, again, straddling community application only needs local state approval, doesn't need the regional uh, approval, um, assuming certain things, which I, I won't get into. Uh, and. Um, 
uh, and, and so that, that application was uh, submitted in January of this year and approved in April, and, uh, and then in, in May, the Midwest Environmental Advocates and others, legal and voters and others, uh, filed a, a legal challenge. And their challenge is based on what? They, they believe that diversions of this sort should be for public purposes, for residential purposes, is that it? Yeah, public water supply purposes pri primarily for, for residential use, and... Um, uh, and that's sort of the key, the key language uh, in, 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 the, in this whole Foxconn debate and in, and in this legal challenge. And, but then again, going back, so you've got this unique case where you, know, you have the drafters of the compact still around, so going back and interviewing them, I had uh, compact authors in disagreement on what that language meant in they relation don't know to what Foxconn. It means, yeah. So you had like sort of the founding fathers disagreeing about what the different articles of the Constitution might mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and fervently in disagreement, uh, I might add. And so, um, and the reason the disagreement is, and again, this, this, this is all this complexity that we've been talking about, but with these straddling community applications is that this public water supply, some of the authors told me, refers to the community itself, Mount Pleasant, that's requesting the water. And in this case, when you have that interpretation with a water diversion for 13,000 employees, it doesn't sound like it's primary for residential purposes. But other authors of, of the compact said, no, no, that primary residential language refers to the water utility that's delivering the water. In that case, it's the community of Racine the vast majority of its customers are residential, and so therefore Foxconn's perfectly fine uh, under the compact. I'm oversimplifying, there's a lot of lawyers in the room, I'm oversimplifying <laughs> here. Um, but that's sort of the gist of it. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it, and, that's, and that's, I think, what's gonna be teased out uh, through, through this, uh, this, this, this legal challenge. And I, and I will say, and it's, it's, it's in the book, that uh, it's not unexpected at all that there would eventually be legal challenges over the Great Lakes Compact, like the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act. All these big, important, transformative environmental pieces of legislation have all been refined through litigation. It's always been expected that the compact would be as well. And so here we are. Uh, a couple of final questions on Foxconn. How much of the water that, that Foxconn wants to use would be returned, actually, Lake Michigan? Because that's, that's been key in any diversion request, water being returned to the lake. Yeah, and so a couple things we should say. So Foscon, since a lot of this has broke, has, has announced a zero uh, uh, you know, liquid discharge uh, technology that they're going to use, which would drop down their overall diversion to something like 2.5 million gallons per day. Um, but the issue is, you know, on the return uh, flow is that is how much consumptive use is involved. Um, and this consumptive use idea is with a, with a municipal application. Again, it's not specifically defined, but in the Great Lakes Compact, there is an allowance for consumptive loss for a water diversion, understanding that not always would 100% of the water be returned. Uh, there might be a loss of between 5 and 15%, depending on who you talk to. But with an industrial operation like Foxconn, the consumptive use goes up much higher. It's in the, sort of the 40 percentile range, and that's just through evaporation and integration of water and the products and, and, and the manufacturing process, et cetera. So there will be more water loss sort of on a per-gallon basis with the Foxconn water diversion. I want to follow up on something you said earlier, and that is that the people who created the compact didn't necessarily expect to be dealing with a diversion request the, the likes of which we're seeing with, with Foxconn, the Foxconn-related diversion request. I, I just find that hard to believe, given the, the, the interest that, that people in the Midwest have about bringing companies to the Midwest, touting the fact that we have water and other places don't have water, that somebody couldn't foresee something like this coming to, to the Great Lakes Basin. Yeah, I think it's the idea was that uh, behind the compact, as I said earlier, was to rather than send water to job, to bring the jobs to the water, and I think the authors of the compact would envision that a facility this large mm. would just nudge itself over 2,000 feet and be entirely <laughs> be within, within the, the yeah. Great Lakes Basin and not have to deal with all this uh, other stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it is a fascinating case. I mean, as, as you know, I'm giving a talk at Discovery World tomorrow night, and I have the Fox Hunt is this amazing uh, architectural uh, sort of uh, uh, model of the whole facility down in Mount Pleasant that they unveiled uh, during an open house earlier this summer. And I've asked a graphic designer to place 
the Great Lakes Basin line right over the top of the photograph of that model. And I think that's the thing that, they, that, that the authors of the compact said, you know, we just didn't, we didn't think that someone would put a facility like that right there. Do we know why they, they did that? I, I mean, I've had people, some of the groups that are challenges in this court say, they just should have moved it uh, slightly east, and there wouldn't be this problem. Yeah, I mean, there's challenges with uh, real estate purchases, yeah. I think, was the biggest problem. There's one yeah. particularly large uh, landowner there that, that, that uh, as I understand it, was not interested in selling and sort of complicated things. But if you, if you look, I'm not suggesting, and just to make it clear, I'm a journalist, I'm not an advocate, so I'm not on either side of Waukesha or Fox Connor or any of these other things. But if you jigsaw puzzle it, you could rotate that campus and get it all into the land that they wanted, but that's a guy who doesn't know anything about how assembly lines work. So, um, Right there with you on that. Um, let's talk uh, about two final points, and we'll take some questions from the audience. One of them is something that in this book, which is available for sale outside, I should say, um, one of the things is what happened in Pleasant Prairie. So this is a community just south of Kenosha, and I don't think many people even knew about this, that, that um, Pleasant Prairie had a, a diversion, uh, and it was tripled in size. And most people didn't know it was tripled in size, even though the compact, my understanding was, was in effect at that time. What happened in Pleasant Prairie? How was that possible? Is it legal? Yeah, so Pleasant Prairie was a community, I, I again, also already had a chapter on that before in the original version of the book. Uh, it was one of the, f the first communities to get water under the pre-compact legal mechanism under the Water Resources Development Act, 3.2 million gallons per day, uh, a, a return flow uh, diversion over time. It sort of was, uh, was uh, uh, gradually uh, turned into a return flow diversion. And so what happened was when the compact was passed in 2008, all the states uh, in, in, in the Great Lakes region were required to report existing diversions into the regional body and compact council so that there was this baseline created. And so if those diversions ever were to be, you know, application to increase them in the future, there'd be this public record of where they were right now. Um, and, and so what happened with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, when they reported Pleasant Prairie's amount, they tripled it from 3.2 million gallons per day to 10.69 million gallons. So considerably per day. bigger than Waukesha's diversion. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's making it actually the largest municipal diversion in the state. And nobody knew because uh, it wasn't publicly notified. And, you know, the, the DNR, um, and, you know, they, there's, there's a state statute that, that requires that the sewer plumbing be matched up with the water supply plumbing. So when they went through uh, the baseline work on Pleasant Prairie, they did an analysis on the sewer system, which is apparently quite extensive. And so to create you know, the, the matching water diversion to match that expanded sewer area, they needed to increase the water diversion by their calculations by you know up to 10 10.69 so seven and a half million gallons per day of an of, a, of an extension of or expansion of the Pleasant Prairie water diversion which is more than the Foxconn application almost as much as the Waukesha just the expansion alone uh, and um, uh, and so that's that's been confusing to a lot of people and and the, you know the the lack of any kind of public notification and the and you know the I think the DNR feels a little bit trapped between the state statute on one hand and the compact on the other and the, and the baseline uh, uh, situation. But I mean, a lot of environmental advocates are, you know, how can you, if a baseline is a baseline, how can you change a baseline? And they're kind of struggling with that. And the general public struggling with it too, based on the talks that I've been giving. Is there any chance of legal action in the Pleasant Prairie diversion, this expansion of the diversion? Yeah, at least two environmental organizations are reviewing it legally. Um, and, and I, you know, it's not clear that there is anything that illegal has happened. Um, the DNR is quite uh, confident that they followed the rule of the law, and, and I have no reporting one way or the other at, at this point, because this is all kind of new. Nobody knew about this until just a couple of weeks ago, um, other than you know people at the DNR. So, 
Um, and so, yeah, this Pleasant Prairie thing was, you know, the, the, the big surprise in the book. And I think it's sort of too early in the process to know how it's going gonna, it's gonna to flesh itself out. But it's, it's, it's you know, put a, a big bright light on this whole baseline issue with the Great Lakes Compact. Let's talk about the, uh, the Chicago River uh, diversion because it is sort of the elephant in the room. I think you describe it in the book as uh, the poster child for bad behavior in the Great Lakes. Um, uh, Chicago deciding to reverse the direction of the Chicago River and send its <laughs> sewage down into the Mississippi River. Um, with this concern about invasive species, the Asian carp moving up the Mississippi, getting closer and closer to the Great Lakes, there has been more serious discussion of whether or not steps should be taken to separate the, the Great Lakes watershed from the Mississippi River watershed. Um, this is not addressed in the compact. Uh, is it something that is, uh, and maybe we'll hear from others here, but is it something that, that you see a day where it could be addressed, or the compact could be amended in some way that it could be addressed? Just adding the Chicago diversion yeah. to it? Yeah. yeah. So there were, I mean, there were a couple of sort of uh, third rail issues during the compact negotiations, and what to do with the Chicago diversion was one of them. And by that, I mean, you know, could really blow up the whole, the whole process. And if they had insisted on putting the, the Chicago River diversion into the compact in some form, right. Illinois would have said, we're out. Right, yeah. exactly, and they did. They did say, if you do that, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna back out and you only have a compact for seven states, and that compact would then not be relevant to the state, which has the most population on the Great Lakes and also is home to the largest diversion ever outside the Great Lakes Basin, so that wouldn't necessarily look very good. Um, and the debate there was, it was complex and yet simple. So this, the Chicago diversion is already ruled over by the US Supreme Court, of which most of the Great Lakes states are already parties to that. And so Illinois said, if you add the Illinois diversion to the Great Lakes Compact, we would be the only state that would have two hurdles, the compact hurdle and the Supreme Court hurdle. Okay. And the other states were saying, look, we all need to be parties to this compact. All our old grandfather diversions are part of this compact, and we need to be in it together on the same terms. And Illinois, again, said, well, you can't be on the same terms because we're in the Supreme Court and you're not, at least on the defense. You're all attacking us on the offense in the Supreme Court. And that kind of went round and round and round. And again, completely oversimplifying. Dave Nafsker is probably cringing over here from the, the Great Lakes governors and premiers. He looks OK. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the end, they decided it would be best to have all eight states as parties to the compact. And, uh, and so Illinois went out on that one. Uh, at the end of the book, you talk about what we don't know, and we don't know if there will be litigation, something you just mentioned. I I'm trying to understand what, what litigation might look like down the road. We've given some examples, but when the compact was being conceptualized, I think you talk about this in the book, Peter, that, that there were concerns about whether it might violate the Commerce Clause, whether it might violate uh, international trade agreements. Are those still possible legal hurdles that the compact will have to overcome? Yeah, so the, the, as you might imagine, uh, the compact was lawyered extensively. Um, since there's so many lawyers in the room, one of the interesting things that the Great Lakes officials hired some of the best dry land attorneys in the country from the water arid areas to get their advice, but also to conflict them out so that they couldn't bring a water a piece of litigation against the Great Lakes region. That only lasts so long, right? But uh, uh, some of the top attorneys that could potentially make a legal run in Great Lakes water are working for the governor. So we, that was a fascinating angle to the whole thing. But yeah, I think you know, there's, there's you know, the, the part of the litigation refinement that's gonna come with the compact eventually, and I agree with the governor, you know, this, this is really an issue that's gonna come to the fore in decades down the road. And we're just sort of taking baby steps uh, right now. I mean, if you, literally the document is 10 years old. I think we should say, you know, it's a 10-year-old child and we're getting into adolescence soon and, you know, there'll be a lot <laughs> of maturity with the Great Lakes Compact by the end of this century when I think water tension is going to be extraordinary, not only on this continent, but around the world. Um, and so, but what that looks like and what kind of camel's nose might be out there and that sort of thing is that that's what, that's what a lot of the concern is about precedent and these decisions that are made. But 
Um, again, as I said earlier, I think you know the lakes have never been safer from the threat of long-range, large-scale water diversions. A lot of this stuff is sort of um, you know fine-tuning around the edges of the compact and of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, so uh, pun intended there, but. Um, but as, you, as you, you, you know, alluded to in the end of the book, I do talk to uh, people from the, um, Nevada, Arizona, uh, who are um, uh, uh, politely critical of the Great Lakes Compact idea. Who are they? Who do they? Why do they think they can own this water and hoard this water? And these are questions I think regional leaders are going to have to be able to answer, articulately for for, for people who are outside the Great Lakes space, and, and, and uh, I think that'll be something that'll be more, you know, again, increasingly important in coming years. You said, I think, in the book that the compact is only as strong as the, the leaders of, right. of these states and provinces. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, that's the thing, is that the idea behind the compact, again, was to protect the waters from far-flung uh, people uh, and entities that may make a run on Great Lakes water. I mean, there's, you know, over time with the prior system and this system, there are examples of the Great Lakes governors then trying to kind of do end arounds in little ways on uh, uh, some of the rules or regulations, or at least that's what, the way it's been interpreted by some. And I think that's the, that's the issue is that, you know, could those kinds of activities, you know, potentially create some sort of problem later on, unanticipated? Um, and but yeah, it's really I think it's really important that you know the, the, the governors and the premiers made these rules for themselves and others, and it was very important and very much emphasized by the legal uh, teams that were helping draft the compact that it's really important that the Great Lakes states hold themselves to the same standards that they are for the people who are outside. In other words, denying water to many residents of the state of Wisconsin who are outside the basin mm -hmm. makes it easier for the, the states to deny water to people who are outside the Great Lakes states as well. It's a, a terrific book, uh, and, and you know, when you think about the Great Lakes Compact, we we're talking about this 10 years ago. Uh, so what was happening 10 years ago tomorrow, and I guess I'd forgotten about this, and it was good to refresh my memory. 10 years ago tomorrow, what else happened besides the Great Lakes Compact? Yeah, the, the TARP legislation passed. Wall Street and, bailout. Yeah, Wall yeah. Street bailout. And uh, so there was, a, there was talk about having a signing ceremony for the Great Lakes Compact, and it got completely steamrolled by uh, the Wall Street bailout. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was, sometimes it seems like that was just yesterday, other times it seemed like a long time ago. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a very busy day in Washington that day. It sure was. Let's take some questions from the audience. Again, if you're in the seating bowl, you can press down on the, uh, the black button in front of you. Um, Ryan, uh, our IT person, will also help make that uh, so that we can all hear you. If you're in the back, um, I don't know if it's Ryan over there, there he is. The gentleman with the microphone will come over and hold the microphone. We ask that you keep your questions brief. No speeches. If, if, uh, if you can hold to that, would be great. So raise your hand. We'll, we'll get to a few questions. Yes, sir. I was surprised that all of the Great Lakes governors approved the Waukesha diversion and expected more politics involved. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so the, the, the real... Um, Uniquely, the high drama was in the state of Minnesota, and which hadn't really a been a position that the state of Minnesota had been in in prior water diversion debates. But <laughs> Governor Dayton, uh, a, a Democrat uh, in Minnesota, was as focused on the Waukesha diversion as any personal governor. I mean, obviously, all the states were focused from a staff standpoint, but Governor Dayton was, was intimately involved and really struggled with the Waukesha decision. Uh, but in the end, uh, he, he, uh, he came around, but he held everybody in suspense literally to the last minute. And I have quite kind of a sort of fly on the wall description of uh, how uh, uh, much drama there was right up until the end. But it is surprising to a lot of people that, you know, he had 11,000 comments in opposition to Waukesha, the vast majority opposed. And some people have said, well, why wouldn't they just approve, you know, dis disapprove or, or reject uh, Waukesha's water diversion because of that's what the public seemed to be the public's opinion. But, you know, as the, the, the DNR, if there's a number of DNR officials here in the room who worked on Waukesha and, and, and other Great Lakes states is that, you know, they really felt like they were following the law. Obviously, this is debated and the mayors were quite, uh, you know, uh, upset by some of the, the things that were made. But, 
Um, it was, you know, again, it was one of those things about being the first test case. I mean, it was incredibly heavily vetted. And again, this multi-thousand page application and everything, it makes hard for a governor who has to sort of flight, you know, flip from, you know, issue to issue to really dig deep on. But, uh, but in the end, uh, uh, Governor Dayton was, was convinced that Waukesha um, uh, should be approved. And one of the unique things that I talk about in here with this sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, I call a hell freezing over moment in the Great Lakes is the governor of Michigan, Republican governor of Michigan, sort of the knee jerk, always vetoing uh, type of state, uh, called the so Republican governor of Michigan, called the Democratic governor of Minnesota, convincing, trying to convince him to approve the Waukesha water diversion, which is just wow. That, that was, uh, as even reporting it, I just kind of couldn't believe that that was happening. So let me uh, take a question from one of our friends in the back. Anybody in the back have a question? Raise your hand. Yes. Um, you know, Governor Doyle uh, mentioned some of the challenges going forward. So I guess I'd ask Peter, um, with respect to the other aspects of the compact, the data, the management, unified management, and how you see that playing out, especially in light of changing conditions now that we're seeing um, large uh, flooding issues within and outside of the basin, uh, stormwater, et cetera. Um, and what's the likelihood of the region actually dealing with some of those challenges? And I think that's going to be compounded because even the Waukesha situation, as you know, we still have to deal here in Wisconsin with the return flow aspects of that. Yeah, well, that's, uh, there's a lot in that question, but Peter, I would expect nothing less uh, from you. Um, that's, that's, you know, and Peter's been following this issue for decades and decades and decades, and uh, including back to the, the you know, Tony Earle uh, administration. Um, and so, just first of all, on the data question, so uh, the regional body and the Compact Council keep data on all the diversions and consumptive uses in the Great Lakes Basin, and, and you know, I've had a lot of friendly, conversations with the officials there that the data, the data is not particularly user-friendly to access. Um, and I think part of, you know, the, the, what's been extraordinary about the compact from the beginning is how really transparent the process has been. And we watched, you know, we watched everything with the Waukesha water diversion conversation with the governor's representatives and the provincial premiers. We saw them punctuate sentences, and you know that's how transparent the process was. But the data is where, again, the rubber meets the road. And as a journalist trying to follow all this data, uh, I think we're still working on the the, the 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 data that's available. And then we have you know situations where uh, if you go to if you go to the regional body website and you look at the data, this the province of Ontario and the state of Michigan don't even have names listed next to some of their water diversion or consumptive use areas. Which means, so if there's no geographical name, how do you know where it is? It's just Ontario blank and then a number, um, and so that that's not really tr that does not followed the remarkable transparency that the governors and premiers have followed uh, throughout time. Did that surprise you? When it you did started surprise looking at, me. Yeah, that yeah. it wasn't, that data did not exist? Yeah. yeah, and and part of it is, again, sort of the words, you know, the compacts, think of it as a 10-year-old child, right? And so the report card is a little bit messy, and, and uh, I think over time, you know, we'll get there. Um, and, 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 and yeah, Waukesha is not done. You're right. The return flow thing is going to be huge, and but it's it's, it's gone under. They've been under such scrutiny, thanks to your organizations and, and others. Um, I, I'm sure that the return flow situation will be heavily vetted by the public and other officials uh, in coming years. So, yeah. You want to add anything to that, Mayor Mayor Riley? <laughs> 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 thanks for the question, Mr. McAvoy. Uh, let me uh, try somebody who has not asked a question yet so far today. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, no, right behind you. Right behind. By press. No, hang oh. on. Right behind you. Oh, and that's who I was pointing. <laughs> you talked exclusively with regard to diversion. What about uh, return water? The contaminants, specifically talking about the pesticides, herbicides, nanoproducts that uh, could be coming into the Great Lakes from industrial basins. 
or also the, the communities outside or even within the basin to contaminate the water in the Great Lakes? Yeah, it's an important question. And, and, um, and you know, as I said earlier, the water has to be treated to Clean Water Act standards before it can be returned. Um, one of the things that came up with the Waukesha application is sort of like the question about pharmaceuticals in the water and the ability to you know, remove that. And I think part of the problem is that some of the technologies aren't there that what the public would necessarily like to see with the ability to remove some of this, uh, uh, some of these issues, nanoparticles, pharmaceuticals, you know, other things. You know, there's been a lot, you know, uh, involving with uh, microplastics in the Great Lakes region, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. And just the technology is just not there yet uh, for a lot of the ability to pull, extract all of that stuff out. But I mean, they do have to meet strict Clean Water Act standards and, and uh, you know, state uh, regulatory standards as well. It's not just raw water being returned to the Great Lakes. Other questions? I'll go there and I'll come down. Hi, um, I'm curious about how water bottle manufacturers are seen. Are they considered diversion, um, even though they are within the watershed, but they ship their water outside of the basin? Yeah, and we always get a bottled water question, and it's a real hard one to answer in a short uh, period of time, but I'll, I'll try. So this was, I talked about the, uh, the Chicago diversion being one of the more heated issues in the compact uh, conversation, and bottled water was as well. Uh, bottled water is a huge issue in the state of Michigan. Uh, it's not an issue in the state of Indiana or Ohio. And so you had a big difference among the different water personalities of the eight Great Lakes states uh, when the compact was being negotiated. And so um, uh, in, in, in basically the province of Ontario kind of helped broker uh, uh, an agreement here, which is that the province of Ontario, which had already passed a provincial ban on diversions from the Great Lakes and elsewhere before the compact and international agreement were adopted, decided basically to not sweat the small stuff and decided that bottles smaller than 20 liters would not be regulated under the Great Lakes Compact. 20 liters is roughly 5.7 gallons. So, you know, those big water cooler bottles and larger, that would be regulated under the Great Lakes Compact, but small bottles alone would not be. And that was, that was, that was sort of like the magic number that allowed the compact to make it through legislatures like Indiana and Ohio. I mean, Indiana and Ohio said if we ban bottled water, compact's never getting out of our state. It's never going to Congress. It's never going to be signed. And so the way they handled it was they came up with this 20 liter number, and then they said any state that's a part of the compact that wants to be more restrictive and ban the export of bottled water could do that as an individual state. But in order to get the big group document through, they had to come up with some sort of a compromise number, and it was this 20 liter or 5.7 gallon number. Maybe one or two final questions, and then we'll take a break. We'll go there, and you'll get the final question. Yes, sir. We'll get it. Go ahead. Just keep talking. I have, a, I have a question regarding the comparison of Waukesha with Foxcom. It, it seems to me like it took a lot, many years for Waukesha to get where it is with regard to diversion. And Foxcom, it seems like it took like a few months. What sure. changed? Well, again, so the, the straddling county applicants have this higher bar that, require the, that requires the approval of all eight Great Lakes governors. So that was the difference with Waukesha, is that because it's a straddling county applicant, clean and clear outside the basin, it requires this regional review of all eight Great Lakes governors. Foxconn is a straddling community applicant that only needs the approval of the local governor alone or the governor and the DNR. So that's the big difference, and that is a much faster process, generally speaking. All right. Brief. Am I on? Brief. OK. <laughs> The DNR is supposed to protect our environment, and it shouldn't be that the DNR is in the pocket of the governor, and right now that's what's happening. Uh, what can we do to stop this? What can we do locally so that uh, 
uh, we won't have the factory farms that are polluting our water, that we won't have the sand uh, blasting uh, into the rocks. We have some real environmental problems. And if the DNR is told, don't sue this, let it go, uh, this is our environment. And when we had to sue the DNR way back when uh, Perrier Nestle's wanted to come in, would you speak a little bit about those kinds of issues where the people really don't have the say of what's going to happen? Yeah, so well, first of all, you know, there's a lot of DNR in the room here, and, um, and I know a lot of them well and I've known them for years. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just, not, just not gonna go to the level where they're like in the pocket of the governor. I mean, they're civil servants and they're working hard to do their job. And for the most part, um, the ones I know are you know, great, hardworking civil servants. And, but there clearly are issues that are controversial and of concern to the citizens regarding environmental issues in the state right now. And I understand that. Um, and you know, so what we're seeing, to just use a specific example, with Foxconn, the way the public is asserting itself on these issues is through a legal challenge. And that's part of the process. And as you know, with Perrier, there was also a legal challenge. And so that's, again, a sort of a normal part of the process. If the, if the citizens don't think that the government is doing things the way that it should be doing in this country, you're allowed to file litigation. And that's, that's what we're seeing in many of these cases. I am gonna wrap things up there. Uh, before we go, again, uh, the book is The Great Lakes Water Wars by Peter Annan. It has been revised, I think you said, three new chapters, a new epilogue, four thoroughly rewritten chapters. It is in many ways a, a new book, and we invite you to check that out. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for their time and their attention, and most of all, we'll thank Peter Annan for his, uh, his time with us today. Peter, thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to reconvene. I wanted to spend just a few minutes before I call up our next set of guests to talk a bit about some of the revisions to the compact that are on the way, or not the compact itself rather, but to the procedures, rules, and guidance that govern the day-to-day -day implementation of the compact. Because I think this is a process that has sort of flown under the radar uh, a bit, and, and many aren't aware of it. So just over uh, a year ago, in September of 2017, the Compact Council announced its intent to draft some updates to, as I said, these procedures, uh, guidance, and rules that help control the day-to-day -day implementation of the Compact and the handling of diversion applications. So each member of the regional body or Compact Council appointed one representative to the team, the uh, drafting team that's preparing these updates. And as I understand it, the team also includes representation from some interested stakeholders, so the city's initiative and uh, others who are interested in the process. Um, so I'd like to just briefly introduce both the timing and the substance of these uh, updates. Um, first, the timing. To me, at least, it didn't appear coincidental that uh, the changes were uh, begun or announced uh, initially in September of 2017. There's some sense that this had been in the works uh, for a while, uh, but it certainly came hard on the heels of the Compact Council's settlement with the city's initiative that resolved uh, the city's initiative's challenge to the Compact Council's approval of the Waukesha diversion request. Uh, some provisions of that settlement strongly implied, if not even required that the council would introduce some updates of this nature or at least investigate the possibility of doing so. The process is moving fairly quickly, I would say, at least uh, in comparison to the normal speed of administrative rulemaking. And indeed, it's hewing pretty closely to an approximate schedule that had been laid out in that same settlement agreement between the Compact Council and the city's initiative. The revisions have already been through a preliminary draft and a first round of public comment. 
Uh, that comment period resulted in some revisions, and a second draft is now out for a public comment and review. Uh, as I understand it, there's a public hearing tomorrow in Indianapolis that's also uh, available to follow remotely uh, if anyone is interested, and the final round of public comments is due in about a week uh, by October 10th. Uh, the council, as I understand it, expects to decide whether to adopt any changes at its meetings in early December. So this is a process that's fairly well along already. Um, let me talk uh, briefly about the purpose of the revisions. What, what do they do? Uh, the first thing I want to make clear is they do not change the substantive provisions of the compact. They could not, of course, uh, by administrative rule. They are procedural in nature. Nevertheless, I think they are important, and there is already some controversy surrounding them. And that controversy extends even to an initial disagreement over the form of the revisions. The proposed updates identify various sections of what's being drafted as rules or regulations, and other sections as guidance, non-binding guidance on the council. So parts uh, one and two of the revisions affect the uh, compact guidance. They in include a set of definitions, uh, a list of what's required in diversion applications, and the sequence of the process for review and approval of those uh, applications. So by treating those items as guidance, the council reserves the discretion to deviate from them if circumstances warrant doing so. Uh, the last three subsections are denominated regulations. They are rules of practice and procedure for hearings before the council. They discuss how modifications can be made to council decisions, and they specify a process for future rulemaking. So those sections will be binding uh, on the council with no uh, potential for deviation. Um, so this bifurcated structure has already generated some disagreement. Uh, among some groups of stakeholders who uh, believe the council should adopt all of the changes as binding regulations uh, to remove any uncertainty over how it will handle diversion uh, applications. Um, so that's one uh, aspect of this, but aside from uh, the way the changes are characterized, uh, there are three uh, sections of the updates that I'd like to briefly discuss. Um, the first, uh, first one is that the updates formalize the process for a hearing before the council in the event of a challenge to one of, a, uh, one of the council's decisions. There was a very minimal description of uh, this hearing process in the compact itself. The compact just refers to the right of a challenger to a hearing before the council without specifying the contours of that hearing. Uh, so it's fair to say that there was some uncertainty about this, particularly in the run-up to the Waukesha challenge about exactly how that would be handled and what procedures would be followed. The proposed rules remedy this by specifying particulars related to, for example, filing deadlines, the content and form of briefs, motion practice, the administrative record, oral argument, uh, and various other aspects of procedure before the council. So these are the types of things that seasoned litigators would surely expect would be covered uh, in rules of practice and procedure, and that had always been the case uh, in our courts, uh, but not in terms of practice before uh, the council. So that's one area. Um, second, the rules contain some provisions intended to ensure that the public has adequate notice and opportunity for comment on proposals pending before the council. Uh, so in the case of a diversion application specifically, the rules require each party to, quote, take actions to ensure that the public within their jurisdiction has an opportunity to comment. So that could include a public meeting or not. Uh, as Peter mentioned in his conversation with Mike, there was some controversy over the number of public meetings that, was, uh, that were held in the context of the Waukesha uh, application. Uh, and that's generating controversy here as well. Some stakeholders believe the rules should be revised to require a public meeting in every uh, party jurisdiction, and others believe that would be overly burdensome and would allow some discretion or flexibility on the parts of the individual uh, states uh, to handle that process in, in their jurisdiction. Uh, third, and certainly the most controversial uh, provision, at least among uh, those I've polled in this regard, uh, is Section 323, which sets a presumption of who pays for the costs incurred by the council itself as a result of the challenge process. 
so you can imagine that uh, the council generates significant costs when uh, one of these hearings is held. Uh, so specifically mentioned in the provision are uh, costs of the court reporter, rental of a hearing room, travel expenses for the council and its staff, uh, related expenses and including um, most significantly, perhaps for those of us uh, in this room, uh, fees and costs of the council's uh, legal team and legal uh, advice. Um, so the, the question goes to who has to pay for those costs? Is it the challenger or not? And the rule seems to set a presumption uh, that it is, although uh, the rule also notes that no cost will be assessed upon any participant in excess of its ability to pay as demonstrated to the chair of the compact council. So there is a, a something of an escape valve there. And so the uh, panelists that I'm about to introduce and others that I've talked to, I think it's fair to say, have differing views on this provision. Uh, some believe it will have a chilling effect on challenges due to the threat of uh, additional costs being imposed, and others uh, rely on the inability to pay provisions. And so there are many other aspects of the updates uh, to the council, uh, rather the compact procedures, guidance, and rules that are being considered, but uh, those are some of the most uh, significant. So um, with that as prologue, I'd like to introduce our next guests uh, to reflect on these proposed changes, uh, react to the conversation with uh, Peter Annan, and give their opinions on the relative successes and shortcomings of the compact over its first decade. So let me now invite Shaylee Pfeiffer and Dave Ulrich to the stage. Uh, Shaylee Pfeiffer is a natural resources staff specialist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Bureau of Drinking Water and Groundwater Water Use Section. Uh, that's a section that was created to implement the Great Lakes Compact and also is responsible for uh, environmental reviews of high capacity wells, another controversial subject that we're not touching on much today. Uh, she has been involved in the development and subsequent implementation of the compact and its state implementing legislation since the beginning, I think it's fair to say, all the way back to uh, 2004. Uh, she also provided lead staff support for the Waukesha and Racine diversion application reviews. She has a master's degree in hydrogeology from UW-Madison and a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Carleton College. Dave Ulrich, our other guest for this panel, is an advisor to the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, where he previously served as its executive director. His responsibilities include providing advice and counsel to over 130 uh, US and Canadian mayors from across uh, the Great Lakes Basin. Um, prior to working with the city's initiative, he served for 30 years at the US Environmental Protection Agency's office in Chicago, working on environmental issues in the six states of the upper Midwest. He served in many capacities, including acting regional administrator and deputy regional administrator. He graduated from Dartmouth with a degree in English and received his law degree from the University of Wisconsin. So won't you please join me in welcoming Shaley and Dave. So thanks for joining us. I wanted to start with a, a general question about the compact. What do you believe or rank as its greatest achievements during its first decade of, of life? If it's a 10-year-old child, as Peter had described it, um, how's, how has it been doing? Shaley, maybe we could start with you. Sure. Well, I appreciate Peter's reference to the Compact or the Compact Council regional body as a 10-year-old child. I think that's a really um, sort of apt framing of, of what you can expect and what you have. And I would really frame that as the the biggest achievements are creating this regional body and the Compact Council. So those are the organizations that get the work done. It's setting up this framework where you have Canadian provinces, US Great Lakes states being able to work together, figuring out this consistent framework for engaging with each other and engaging with the public. And in the last 10 years, they've worked on developing water use protocols, initial procedures. So you know, Dave was referencing the update to those procedures. Those were first put together in 2010. We've got the Waukesha proposal, Cities Initiative Challenge, um, and now this procedures update. And all of those pieces are these organizations, the Regional Body and Compact Council, getting together and forming those relationships. And I think that's really not a flashy component, but it's really the fundamental strength of, of, of the compact. Dave, I know you have some 
ideas about the shortcomings, yeah, but it, let's focus on achievements for the moment. What do you think about what's gone right so far? Well, uh, first, a toast to everyone with uh, in-basin water uh, here. Uh, I th and I think it's very important, uh, and I will say that the most significant thing in my mind is it's still there, and it's very strong, alive, and well. It's very important to put the compact itself in a broader context of things that we have in place uh, to protect and restore the Great Lakes. Obviously, that focuses on water quantity. Uh, much before has been on water quality and the fishery. But we've got the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty. We've got the 1956 Convention on Great Lakes Fisheries that went after sea lamprey, 1972. Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and this is really another uh, jewel in the crown, if you will, that shows how states and countries, and I will say cities, uh, can work together uh, to protect a major natural resource. So I think uh, the compact is alive and well. Uh, the city's initiative, and I would be less than honest if I didn't say have some concerns about the implementation <laughs> of the compact, but the compact itself is very sound, alive, and well. I don't know if a 10-year-old chi child is the best uh, metaphor for it, but uh, I can't come up with a better one. So I think it's uh, out there you know, flexing its muscles and becoming an adult. So you mentioned some concerns about the implementation, and I think it's, why don't we get to that? What, uh, what specifically are you referring to? And, uh, I can't imagine that uh, there'd be any question about uh, what concerns would, we would have. In the broadest sense, I think, uh, and we had, uh, we, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, had the opportunity and were cordially uh, invited uh, by Sam Speck of Ohio to actively engage. We were the only local government representative there. And um, so we were very much a part of the creation of it. Uh, we're very aware of the straddling cities, straddling county, where the, you know, the uh, basin line became kind of a dotted line. And I guess uh, our impression was that these would be rare exceptions. Uh, we knew about Waukesha, and we knew that that was contemplated as part of it. But uh, very honestly, with now what we learn about Pleasant Prairie and Waukesha, and Foxconn, it almost appears that it's the rule that you can take water out of the basin rather than the exception. And uh, that, that is a concern about uh, the implementation of it. And um, actually, we had hoped that uh, the uh, new and revised rules might help address some of that concern, but uh, uh, they, the new rules and guidance uh, have not really addressed it adequately. I want to get to that, but Shaley, I wanted to give you a chance to respond about what you or DNR sees as some of the uh, difficulties so far. Yeah, I think that you know one of the framings of these concerns is is um, you know unforeseen weaknesses or what was in the compact that people didn't anticipate as being a problem. And I would argue that you know really all of these issues were known mm -hmm. during the compact. So my experience of working with those drafters is that these were really thoroughly discussed and. People knew it was an umbrella document creating parallel management programs. And that many of these concepts that I think a lot of the challenges have come around are vague in the document, and they're vague for a reason. It's maybe not even really a weakness of it, but it was as far as people could get. So you have this situation, and this is what Governor Doyle was mentioning previously, if you have 10 jurisdictions coming together to manage the largest fresh water surface resource in the world. And that's not going to be an easy task. And that you know, you were involved in those negotiations much more so than I was. I heard about it kind of behind the scenes. And people would come back, oh, it's not going well. Oh, it's going great. You know, This total ping pong game. And you have a situation where people got as far as they could get um, with, you know, with, that, with what the language is in the compact. And that as that was happening, you know, I did presentations explaining to people before the compact was approved in Wisconsin. And overwhelmingly, the reaction I got from people was, this is a great idea. It's never going to happen. And you know, that was really eye-opening to me at the beginning of a career to kind of see this, where you have these people who are seasoned veterans um, 
of administrative policy, you know, really saying, I'm going to be optimistic here. I'm going to be um, visionary and try and put something together that may never come to, may never happen. And that that included a really healthy dose of pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And so that all of these pieces that are in the compact now, I think that they were well known ahead of time, or I would have you know, expected that, that is well known ahead of time and that the compact could get as far as it could get in order to have something that all these jurisdictions could really sign off on. Dave, you mentioned that the proposed updates to the procedures and guidance and rules don't go far enough to address some of your concerns. And I thought I'd ask, what would you have done differently, or what do you wish those updates contained? Well, we provided a, a lot of suggestions and ideas as to how uh, they could be improved. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of those, but a couple of them I think were uh, particularly important. And although uh, Peter mentioned the uh, transparency of uh, the whole process. I have some, some questions about that from the Waukesha experience and, what, and, and other things. But uh, at, at the very root of it, uh, people in the United States and Canada all over the basin care deeply about the resource and about diversions. I don't think most people appreciate that a lot of Canadians in particular have never gotten over the Illinois diversion. I go up and give talks up there and you know, they'll say, when are you gonna stop you know, sending water down the Mississippi River? They've never gotten over that. And when the Waukesha decision came out, it was kind of, oh, here we go again, even though the compact clearly says just straddling counties. So um, that, was, uh, that was a real concern that there wasn't more extensive public engagement. And very honestly, to have just one public hearing in Waukesha does not represent the feelings of the Great Lakes community. And I take my hats off to Michigan and Minnesota who had their own individual um, uh, public hearings and public processes. We strongly recommended that there be public hearings in each one of the 10 jurisdictions, Canada and the United States. Um, and it basically, as I understand the, the draft rules, they say that a jurisdiction may hold a public hearing, and then something about informing uh, the public about uh, the overall process. Uh, we think that diversions are a big deal, and that, uh, that they should very deliberately I uh, have a public hearing process. The other thing, the other major point that we made was that these should all be uh, firm rules. All of the procedural things should be uh, firm rules. Uh, those who are in the legal profession know you've got to have some reliability and predictability on how things are going to go forward. Well, it's a combination of rules and guidance, and there's a lot of significant things that are just guidance, and it appears that the Compact Council has the ability to follow it if they want and not follow it if they don't want. So those are uh, two very fundamental things. The third one, as, as David alluded to, is the whole issue of uh, costs of the proceeding. I think it has a tremendous chilling effect to essentially have to pay for due process. There are eight governments, 10 governments, who come together and if they can't fund the process that will consider challenges to decisions that are made, I think that's really kind of a sad state. It's almost like going back to a poll tax where you gotta spend money if you wanna go and vote. If you wanna exercise your rights to due process, you've gotta come up with a lot of money. And frankly, for uh, nonprofit organizations, even coming up with uh, the money to get legal representation is a very difficult thing. We were very fortunate because an outstanding law firm, Jenner and Block, provided uh, pro bono legal services to our organization. I'm not gonna say how much those legal services were wor worth, but it was a huge amount of money and, and I'll be forever grateful. But to actually have to pay the eight states here or uh, throw in the two provinces to just have the due process. Now, there's an ability to pay clause in there. Uh, 
I don't think that's going to give uh, non-government organizations a lot of uh, comfort uh, because, uh, you know, they could, you know, wind up going under as a result of this. But so a big concern about that as well. Shaley, I assume DNR had some role or participation in helping to prepare the new rules. And what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think that you did a really nice over overview of just kind of what's in these and some of the framing of it. And one of the comments you made was, um, that this process is moving quickly. Um, and that's, you know, I always like coming to these to kind of hear some of these other perspectives on, on how, how these pieces get played out and, and versus how the Compact Council is working on its business and how that looks from the outside. Um, as you mentioned, the rules are out for public comment right now, and that comment is really important. It's important for people to take a look at it. The procedures and these updates, you know, many of the pieces of it that are difficult, and Peter Annan alluded to this, is that this is really in the weeds. I mean, these are the, the sort of nitty-gritty details, and that is challenging, I think, to often access what exactly is in all the nuts and bolts of these and, and what the um, meaning of it is. But one of the pieces of this moving quickly is that I would really compliment um, Grant Trigger, who is the representative from Michigan, um, and he's been a great um, you know, member of the council in his sort of vision on how do organizations work and how do they develop over time. And his thought with this rules um, revision is that we will develop a scope, we'll define what we're going to talk about, and we'll do it in a very specific timeline. And I think that's from the framework of oftentimes organizations take up tasks and they never complete them because there's not a real clear framework for how to get that work done. So I would see this set of rules revisions, and I think we're hearing this from within the committee that's working on this as, well, what about these other issues? And that there's likely to be sort of a continual process of working on some of these issues, and that this was sort of a first go around of a set of issues that people could take on in a set time frame and really make some progress one way or the other. Um, you mentioned the, the issue about sort of rules versus guidance, and there's been lots of discussion and, and debate about that. I think that the way that this has moved, um, you know, I think governments always move slower than, you know, NGOs would like to see, the, see things move along. But I think one of the key things here is that, you know, the, this group has a sample size of one for a diversion to look at. So at the DNR, there's all sorts of permits where we'll get 100, 200 applications for that permit in a, um, in a year. And there's an ability then where you have those rules, you, you know what the range of issues that you're going to face, and you can address those in rules pretty comprehensively knowing what you're get, going to get. In this case, with the application process, we've got this sample size of one to reference for what that guidance should be. And that... Um, you know, maybe down the road it'll be easier to refine that, but that it's really not in sort of a good government approach to hamstring what that um, requirements for following that process are um, too soon in this whole evolution. I'd, I'd also say with that, I think there's maybe more comfort, this may just be my own perspective, but on the front end with the application side of it, you, you need to get an application through you know, nine other jurisdictions. And so anything that's in those, in that guidance for what needs to be in the application, there's a lot of opportunity for pressure to make sure that that's provided. I mean, they're just, you know, a jurisdiction's not going to review it if the information isn't there that everybody agreed to should be there. So I think that that's kind of one place where there's some comfort. On the other side, with this hearings process, that to me is the most significant piece of it. When we get, when the challenge came through from the city's initiative, the council spent about six months trying to figure out what to do next, how to address this, what was the process. And um, that kind of inefficiency over process is really draining to all of these people who have um, a whole lot of other things to do than to think about what a 70,000 you know, person community in, in another state is getting their water from. And so once that process got figured out, then the council could really focus on what the issues of the decision were, not how to go about doing this review. And so to me, that's really significant to um, memorialize that in rules or guidance and take that experience, put that in place, let you know, folks like the city's initiative know what they're going to get, you know, whoever that challenger might be, what that process will look like. And that's, you know, that's just a much more effective way to run an organization. Um, 
I'll just mention that I don't have much to add on your, your cost question. I think that there, one of the pieces that does come up is, yeah, how are people, things gonna get paid for? You've got state governments with strap budgets and you also have, um, in this case, you know, the, the community that, you know, in this case it was Waukesha and they've put in a lot of money in order to have that review. Um, and I think that's been a question as to what level of engagement there's been in this review process by municipalities or people who might be affected um, by what's put together in these rules and procedures. When we have discussions and gatherings like this about the compact, we tend to focus on the ban on diversions, and rightly so. That's a major feature and an important part of the compact. But you said something interesting to me, Shaley, in one of our previous discussions, which was there's a lot more in the compact than just the ban on diversions. And Governor Doyle echoed that theme, I think, as well in his presentation this morning. So what were you referring to, and what, what else do you want people to know about what's in the compact and what's happening? Yeah, I mean, Governor Doyle, I think, gave a really nice overview of what um, is sort of more comprehensively in the compact and how that all plays together. I think um, while the diversions are certainly the flashpoint, that emotional engagement that we see across the basement, it is important to recognize with the compact that we've had no diversion proposals from you know, agricultural areas um, that are running short of groundwater in Kansas or, you know, tankers of water. All of those diversion proposals that there have been have been within the geographic scope of what's uh, uh, allowed for in the compact. So I think that's kind of a key piece to understand. But beyond the diversions, you know, what strikes me over and over again is we are working on implementing um, the compact from the Wisconsin DNR perspective is that you have this parallel management programs across the state. Um, you have this water use reporting. So these are ideas that date back to the Great Lakes Charter, but there was tremendously uneven implementation for it. When I think about the level of effort that the Wisconsin DNR was able to put in to providing the Great Lakes Commission with how much water um, different, you know, water use sectors in Wisconsin versus what we have now is just a tremendous dis difference, and that's consistent across the basin. So we're seeing this, you know, commitment from these jurisdictions even 10 years later to really follow through on that. So water use reporting is a key piece of that, um, an improvement to the nuts and bolts on that. And then another piece that I don't think gets much attention, uh, but is this cumulative impacts assessment. So. This isn't a high profile piece of it, but it's central to the function of the compact. You have a checkup every five years of what's the water balance in the Great Lakes. This is informing these managers. If you're gonna do joint management of this resource, then you really need to have that. And we've gone through two rounds of it. Really, it, all it is is looking at what's the water going into the basin, precipitation, inflow, um, you know, from streams, runoffs. And then what's going out of the basin, Evap evaporation, outflows out of the basin. So just that simple sort of checkbook. And then included in that is taking this information that comes from this water use reporting and adding on what's the role of diversions and consumptive uses in that. And at this point in time, you know, those don't even really get into the error bars on what the evaporation is. But by setting up that ability to just sort of say, okay, here's how we do this review, we do it every five years, we have our pulse on it, you really set up a structure where if you're gonna have problems, if you're seeing that there's changes in all this, then you have an ability to act as a region to address those management challenges. Um, and I, I think that's a really key aspect to it. Dave, I wanna to turn to you. You advise and for a long time led this multinational organization with very wide geographic scope. Why do you think southeastern Wisconsin has been such a hot spot for controversy under the compact? And do you think we'll begin to see those kinds of things in other parts of the basin as, as well? Well, to me, it's, it's kind of the accident of geography more than anything else. And uh, had, had there not been uh, a Illinois diversion, I prefer to call it the Illinois diversion rather than the Chicago diversion, <laughs> but um, uh, that would have probably played out down in Illinois as well. Wherever you have this you know, very narrow part of the basin, it's gonna be very difficult to kind of sort through what's in, what's out, what's, on, what's straddling, and how do you deal with what's straddling. 
So um, I guess there may be a couple of other places overall in the basin, but this very narrow stretch, and you know, frankly, in the Chicago-Milwaukee corridor, it's a you know it's a real hot place for uh, for development, uh, residential, commercial, industrial. So there's going to be a lot of focus on this, and uh, I don't think there's you know anything about cheese or milk or badgers that you know, are making it more likely that this is happening here. It's an accident of, uh, of geography, and uh, that's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's made it difficult. Uh, it's interesting because I was thinking on the way up to the, today driving by Pleasant Prairie, and I love Pleasant Prairie, Mount Pleasant, everything's pleasant, you know, in southeastern <laughs> Wisconsin. But uh, Pleasant Prairie was one of the first uh, power plants under the Clean Air Act uh, Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program, uh, which was kind of a, a whole different twist on protecting resources and uh, new development, and, and that was right out of the blocks as well uh, under the, I guess it was the 77 amendments to the Clean Air Act, figuring out how much deterioration is okay. And there were ozone problems, but I think it was still attainment for particulate and sulfur dioxide. So just a little irony that southeastern Wisconsin seems to be a um, ground zero for uh, controversies of, of this nature. And uh, you know this too will play out uh, in time. I, I want to comment a little bit on, on Shaley's remark that the compact is much more than straddling communities and straddling counties. And to me, the, the fact that there is a compact, that the eight states and the two provinces got together and said, we've got to do something to protect this resource was critically important. And all of the other aspects of, you know, there's all this attention on diversions and, you know, frankly, the fact that you got to send it back if you take it out is, is a big deal. And from a quantity standpoint, uh, that pretty much resolves the issues. But the attention level is, is way up on this, and, and that is a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure we're still uh, doing a good enough job on the interplay between quantity and quality. Uh, and that's where the Root River comes into play uh, here as to whether or not it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing or an indifferent thing uh, for the Root River. So uh, I think we need to, we, we tend to put all of our eggs in you know, the quantity basket or the quality basket. And it's kind of interesting how this has played out in the other end of the basin in Lake Ontario where for years and years they negotiated over a plan on how to regulate the levels, the quantity, and this is the International Joint Commission as opposed to a, a compact, and they finally came up with something. You know, the next year, massive rainfall and uh, some flooding and, and shoreline erosion on the U.S. side, and everybody screaming and yelling, just let her go down the St. Lawrence River. Well, Montreal was flooding already, and uh, so these, these battles uh, and, and just the attention to it is very important that I am confident uh, that you know, this will sort itself out as time goes forward. Shaley, in your role in dealing with other states implementing the compact, do you hear that they have concerns similar to ours that are arising in their respective jurisdictions or is everybody focused on southeastern Wisconsin as a result of this accident of, of geography? You know, we keep telling people, when's somebody else going to bring a proposal? When can we not be in the spotlight anymore on this stuff? But no, at this point, there aren't any other proposals that are actively coming forward. I think, you know, I think that's an interesting question on the, you know, sort of Waukesha and precedent, and does this open it up for other people to want to um, apply, or is it really have that, as you say, chilling effect of just who wants to participate in something that, um, you know, is, is so expensive and so time consuming and so rigorous. Um, so I, you know, I, I think ever so often things come up where there's been a municipality has checked in with another state and, um, you know, there's never been any traction for any of those at those points. I really like that you kind of framed the Southeast Wisconsin in the context of Northeast Illinois mm -hmm. um, and, and how you frame that with the geography, because I think some of that gets lost in that there's the Illinois diversion, and so that's all managed under a separate set of agreements, and that's laid out in the compact, and that's what everybody agreed to. But those tensions and that, um, 
you know, sort of water tensions and the issues with the groundwater are the same on both sides of the border. It's just that if you are a community in Northeast West Illinois and you need water, you go to the Lake Michigan Allocation Program and it doesn't, you know, get that regional attention and that regional look um, as it does in Southeast Wisconsin. But, you know, it's, it's that accident of geography. Um, and it happens to be something where there's population industrial corridors. Some of the other places where I think you might see some of this tension around the basin um, don't have those drivers at this point. They don't, you know, there's a lot of rust belt kind of um, issues around the basin where there's, you know, communities that are really struggling and don't have that kind of activity um, at this point. Two things I would like to alert people to. Number one, I do live within the basin in Chicago, so the water that I take is, you know, I'm, I'm in the basin. Uh, secondly, I've been heavily involved in the uh, Asian carp invasive species uh, debates that have been going on kind of ad, ad nauseum at this point. And our organization, the Cities Initiative, has been one of the few strong advocates of looking very seriously at the issue of full physical separation and re-reversing the flow of the Chicago River. We are not very popular uh, because of that, uh, particularly from the shipping industry. I think a lot of their issues could be dealt with. But um, uh, I, and, and there's some questions about, well, you know, so complicated engineering standpoint and whatever. Listen, if, we're, if people were smart enough in 1900 to do what they did to reverse the flow, I would hope that in you know, 2018 we'd be smart enough to figure out ways to do it. And I think there are ways to do it. Uh, it's all the focus is on the four varieties of Asian carp, but there are a whole bunch of other invasive species going back and forth uh, and have over the past and will in the future if that is not, uh, not dealt with. I wanted to give you both a chance to react to some features of the conversation with Peter and some of the questions that he got. And uh, maybe we could start with Foxconn. I know you both have perspectives on that. And um, Shaley, maybe you can address what, DN what the DNR review of the Racine application was like and um, how it did happen so quickly as compared to Waukesha. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to kind of touch on some of these issues. So I think one of the keys with the Racine diversion, there was a question about well, how come Waukesha took so long and Racine was so fast? You know, that sort of dynamic. And I think that really gets, uh, Peter touched on this, Peter Annan touched on this, is that it really gets to what's in the compact and what needs to be looked at. And so for Waukesha, as a straddling community, there was a whole long list of criteria that they had to meet, both from this exception standard and then also specific to the straddling county. So things like showing there without adequate supplies of potable water and then even more so, the reason, no reasonable water supply alternative. And that involved some pretty extensive um, groundwater modeling by the city. And then you know, there was complaints or concerns from some of the comments we got. The DNR ended up redoing some of that modeling, you know, sort of another six months. So sort of the long list of things that Waukesha had to address was very different for a um, community or a straddling community like the the Racine for Mount Pleasant, you know, for that application, it's a very different set of things that needed to be addressed. Um, and so I think, one, we learned with Waukesha how to do the process, just how to hold those hearings, how to frame it, how to make sure the information's on our website, all of those pieces. But then at the end of the day, there was basically three things that we needed to look at to see if they met the criteria for that diversion. And that didn't take a lot of time to figure those pieces out. They were pretty straightforward components. Um, and so that process happened pretty quickly. We did, I mean, we notified the council the previous December, hey, we're gonna get an application for this. It's coming up. We got it in January. You know, we notified the, the council at the same time as the public, hey, we just got an application. It's on our website. Take a look. This is when we're gonna have the hearing on it. Here's that timeline. And, from our perspective, I think that's where that strength of this compact council regional body comes in, is that when there were questions, when there were concerns, you know, I think it was three states that submitted um, uh, letters on, you know, questions about how are we making those decisions, then there's a vehicle, you know, people know each other, there's a vehicle, there's an ability to call, talk, um, you know, have a discussion. And some of that discussion got, summarized in a letter that's also on our website of just here's how we walked through those issues that the 
other states and provinces had and you know provide that to the public so um, that's kind of a, addressing that point of why were those two processes you know somewhat different from a timeline perspective Dave does your group have similar concerns over Racine as you did with Waukesha uh, yeah, similar but not exactly the same uh, Shaley has brought up two points that I think are, are particularly important and as I understand it we're critical in terms of actually getting agreement on uh, the compact itself, and that is not nailing down specifically what no reasonable water supply alternative means and what is a public water supply. I think the danger in that is that um, this will play out to a certain extent on a state-by-state -state basis, and it appears that how Wisconsin defined no reasonable water supply alternative um, had a real influence on the outcome. Well, now other states may define that differently. And I do think that getting a little more precision in terms of what constitutes public water supply, you know, granted, you know, some of it goes to commercial and industrial facilities. Uh, to me, you know, when it was very clear why this additional water was going to be made available, uh, it certainly stretches the imagination to think that this is like in addition to public water supply when you know it appears to be very specifically for an industrial facility. So um, I am concerned about that and once states get together and essentially take on the role to a certain extent of the federal government or at least of a regional government uh, there needs to be, it's the, you know, the old issue of the level playing field. That's why we got all of the environmental laws in the 1970s because, you know, I grew up in Wausau and, you know, all of the pulp and paper mills are going to move to Georgia because the unions aren't strong and they don't care about the environment down there. So we had to get a level playing field across the country and I may be somewhat of an exception, but I do think that the environmental laws of the 1970s have made a huge positive difference in terms of, first of all, the quality of life of Americans and everybody who visits here, but secondly, in terms of, of leveling the play, playing field. And there will always be this certain amount of tension as to how much you defer to the states and how much you've got to have a federal uh, level playing field. But I do think with a uh, a globally significant resource that eight states and two provinces have said, we'll take care of the quantity issue, feds, you know, stay out. There is a certain obligation to make sure that there is a level playing field. And I, a 10 year old isn't going to do that, but maybe by the time they're 25, they'll get it figured out. A couple of final questions, and then I'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, for both of you, the, the first question I have is, we've talked about some of the successes, some of the shortcomings. Uh, overall, what do you think? Has it been a good thing? Is it good policy? Has it been a success, uh, the compact at its 10th anniversary? Yeah, I'll let either one of you. It's start. definitely a good thing. And I think the, um, we're in the law school, I think the jury is still out as to whether or not. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's always dangerous to declare success too early on anything. Um, as I've said, we have concerns that, you know, these first three out of the blocks, uh, it appears, you know, that there was some kind of predisposition. These will be approved. It's just a matter of coming up with conditions and things like that. So I do have uh, some concerns about that. Uh, and uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, straddling counties isn't, isn't a big deal. Uh, in communities in straddling counties. I grew up in Marathon County, which when I was growing up, there were more cows than people. That was the thing we were most proud of. But there's a little sliver that is in uh, the Great Lakes Basin. And Wausau, Wausau chemical contaminated the water supply in Wausau. And in theory, uh, you know, if the, if the, uh, the economics worked out, uh, Great Lakes water could be pumped to Wausau because it's a community in a straddling county. And I don't think that that's a good thing, even though I still have friends back in Wausau, I don't think it's a good thing to send Great Lakes water to, to Wausau. So uh, it's a good thing. Um, I think that there are some real questions on the implementation. 
we are disappointed in uh, new guidance and rules that have come out. We settled our case on the basis of this. And by the way, I wanted to make it clear, part of the settlement was that we would not appeal or otherwise challenge the Waukesha decision or encourage people to do it. And I want to make it very clear, I'm not encouraging anybody to do that, and we are not going to do it ourselves. But it's too late, I can right? still raise Mayor? questions about it. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor Riley and Dan. I mean, I definitely would say it's a success. I think you frame a lot of the big issues that, that there's a lot more work to be done. The, the real issue is, is this was framing, what are you going to have happen in 50 years when you do have water stress? So this is really the, the sort of beginning stages. You've had continued commitment from um, you know, all the jurisdictions, even as you've had uh, governments change since the, the people who, you know, the governors that signed off on it, and you've still continued to see that commitment. I think that's been really critical. I think another um, kind of piece that from working in government that's been a real advantage to us is on this diversion side. You know, with WERDA, we had these issues where there was no timeline for decisions, yeah. there was no process for decisions, and no standards. And so that made it really difficult to have any kind of resolution on the process. And I think that, um, you know, without any kind of guidance or ability to move something forward, especially when these things are so controversial, is that it, it makes people not want to play by the rules. And here, there's a really clear set of rules that people can follow, and there's a mechanism for people to argue about whether those rules were applied correctly or not. But it, it really, you know, sort of enforces that idea that, um, there's a set of rules, and you can follow these, and you can work through that. And That's why they should all be rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me close with this before I, I turn to you. Sorry. Uh, oh, we've heard a number of times that the ultimate success or failure of the compact is yet to be judged or evaluated. What do you see as the critical issues coming up in the second decade of the compact and beyond? Um, I'll just go ahead. I think it's this continued organizational development, but I also think it's you know, continuing to build those relationships among the jurisdictions, but also with the capacity of the advisory committee. So, you know, Cities Initiative, National Wildlife Federation, um, Great Lakes Industries, there's a whole variety of groups that are part of this advisory committee. And so I think one of those pieces is going to be a challenge of how do we tap into the, you know, sort of knowledge and, um, you know, capacity of those groups. Same thing with tribes and First Nations, that sort of continuing those efforts to build those relationships. I think that's going to be a key piece. Um, we need the investment of all of the members to, to continue. I think that, you know, that's sort of clear that without that investment, nothing really happens. You lose momentum. Um, and then it's maybe a little more detailed level, but there's a science strategy that's part of the compact. And I think that's a place that there could be more work that's developed. We've got this, um, you know, water use reporting that goes on. That's really gotten sort of ironed out. And the part of that is taking that information that we're gathering. You know, it's interesting to hear Peter Annan's reflections on how it's difficult to access that. I'd really like us to, you know, like to see the Great Lakes Commission and the Compact Council regional body working together to really share more of what is this information that we're collecting and what does that mean in a way that's accessible um, to the public. Consumptive use kind of falls under that same umbrella. It's a fairly nebulous concept with a lot of sort of coefficients piece, and I think that would be a piece that fits into this kind of science strategy idea of, you know, how do you, how do you really understand what's coming in and what's going out of the basin, um, and so you can do long-term management of that resource. Uh, I'm a big believer in continuous improvement, and I think there is a real uh, commitment uh, from the jurisdictions uh, to continue to improve what uh, you know is a historically significant document. Uh, my sense, uh, and, and I want to preface this by saying that I'm a big believer in something called the public trust, doc, public trust doctrine, that the uh, basically the states, much more than the federal government, hold these water resources in trust for the public the broader public, and I often refer to the Great Lakes community, which is um, an international public. I think that there is a feeling that um, a lot more deference has been given to Pleasant Prairie and, and Fox Con and Waukesha than the broader public.
public of uh, the Great Lakes community. And I think there needs to be a, uh, uh, a more, if you will, vibrant public participation process in the future. And frankly, uh, you know, throwing something out like, uh, well, you may have to pay for this, uh, it will have a real chilling effect. I know it would, would have had a chilling effect on our organization. You know, we kind of lived hand to mouth, uh, grant to grant uh, that way. And I do think that uh, much more certainty in terms of what the process will be. And, and you know, granted with something new, you do have some figuring out to do, but there is a Federal Administrative Procedure Act. I think most states have an Administrative Procedure Act. So running something through a review and approval process, I processed a lot of permits under the Water Act and under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. So processing requests and applications and permits is not a new thing. And there are some fundamentals of due process that all of the good law students here learn about. Uh, so uh, those are some things that I think need to be focused on in the future to uh, ensure it, its success. But it, this is just critically important to this uh, part of the country. And um, I, uh, I have great confidence in good public service commitment like people like Shaley. And I know she's not in the governor's pocket or anybody else's pocket. So. <laughs> With that, I think I'll invite questions from the audience. I'll follow the same guidelines that Mike laid out. Please raise your hand and let me call on you. And uh, no speeches, please. Yes. This is more of a legal clarification question that comes out of your statement that you wish there were firmer rules. Does that mean that this is not a law, and can it be made a law, considering that it's not coming from a federal standpoint and involves only the states, eight states? Um, I can clarify on that. The, the compact is a law, and then in Wisconsin, there's compact implementing legislation. So the piece that we're discussing up here is this procedures. There's sort of a companion document to the compact that's more detailed about who do you, you know, if you're going to have a diversion that would go to the regional group, who do you file that with? What's the timeline for that? What are the responsibilities for the secretariat to distribute that information? If you're going to challenge a decision by the compact council, what's the process that that goes through? But one of the fundamental differences for the compact is that you end up with a document that is law in all of the states and companion laws in the two Canadian provinces. And so there's a requirement that all these jurisdictions follow through on what's laid out in the compact and then their own implementing legislation. That really is a very interesting question because the compact, uh, as Shaley has said, is law, and there are many federal environmental laws as well, but legislatures and Congress can't get into all of the nitty-gritty details, and that's why there are rules and regulations and guidance, and having worked for US EPA for 30 years, there were a lot of criticisms of EPA of things that were done as guidance that they said should have been rules. And you have to go through a much more formal process when you establish rules, and then you're kind of, kind of locked into it. Uh, I don't want to venture too deeply into Wisconsin law, but I will ask to be bailed out by all of the great Wisconsin lawyers here. But I think Wisconsin in particular, uh, had the state legislature very strictly oversees what <laughs> the DNR and other uh, agencies do in Wisconsin. And number one, I think they review all rules. And number two, there's some specific legislation that says that a, an agency can't do something unless it is specifically authorized uh, under the law that the legislature passed. So there's kind of an interesting interplay. I don't know if I got right. close to right. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I know that David uh, initially addressed water, water coming back into the uh, compact area. My question is, does the compact have any position on preservation of wetlands within the compact area? Um, 
I, I'm trying to think if the compact specifically addresses wetlands. Is that uh, a water? It does not. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, David Nasker, who's a, a reigning expert on all of these things. But that was an issue that came up in Waukesha with a concern about additional pumping of uh, uh, groundwater might adversely affect uh, the wetlands. So it certainly isn't addressed directly, but when you're looking, which I think is very important, at broader ecological impacts in, uh, in the Great Lakes Basin, uh, I would not be surprised that that issue will continue to come up. And I think there's a bit of an issue uh, down with Foxconn, not necessarily with wetlands uh, and the compact, but um, uh, an issue I know Lake County, Illinois is concerned about potential flooding because of the construction of the facility, not the withdrawal and diversion and return of the water, but the presence of the facility itself. So, uh, and, and that's really a good point. I think we have a tendency to segment things. I referred to water quality and water quantity, land, water, air. You know, at the end of the day, they're all related to one another, and we are getting better at integrating those, but not so formally under the compact. But it would be pretty hard to ignore uh, a, uh, an, a, a significant wetland issue in the context of a diversion request or, or other water quantity issues. Yeah, no, I think you've got a, a good framing of it. The, the language in the compact talks about impacts to waters of the basin or water-dependent natural resources. So it's not specifically discussing wetlands, but I think there are a, are a place, as you address, that either in water use permits, um, those kinds of issues could come into play, or that certainly was an issue with the Waukesha Review in terms of looking at what you know, reasonable water supply alternatives there were and what kinds of environmental impacts some of the other alternatives they had um, looked at um, would have on wetlands. And just a little sequel to that, you may be interested or maybe terrified to know that we still do not know what a water of the United States is. <laughs> And we don't have time to get into that one. No, no. I, I, <laughs> but to, some wetlands are and some are not. <laughs> I'll have to cut it off there. Please join me in thanking Shaley Pfeiffer and Dave Allred. <laughs> so at this point, I'd like to welcome Peter and Mike back to the stage one last time. We have a tradition in the law, and I know in other disciplines as well, of discourse and response and then reply. So just as we allowed the panelists to reflect on and respond to some of the things that came up earlier today, we want to give the same opportunity to Peter and Mike. So I'll turn it back over to them to close out the discussion today. Mike and Peter. So uh, I, I guess this is a chance to, uh, to offer some thoughts on anything you've heard today. So we heard from Former Governor Doyle, we heard from Shaley and Dave. And Dave, um, anything jump out at you that you'd like to, to weigh in on? Yeah, well, I think there's a there's you know we're in this sort of first stage of the compact as we've talked about numerous times. But there's some things sort of nibbling at the edges that are new that we haven't hit on directly, and that as a journalist covering this, I'm wondering about it. We have one legal challenge already that's been filed over Foxconn. We have legal challenges that are being considered over Pleasant Prairie. So I think one of the questions is, you know, this are we are we potentially starting to head into the sort of legal challenge era, or will this just be one-offs? And um, so I think that's just a, you know, as an observer of the compact debate, that's one of the questions that that I'm uh, uh, that I have, uh, you know, personally. And I think that it's also, and we'll be talking about this tonight uh, more at Discovery World. I mean, especially here in in Wisconsin, and we tend to get really deep into some of these straddling issues, et cetera, because it really is hot right here. But you know, we have 20% of the Earth's surface water here in the Great Lakes, and I tend to really look at this as a basin-wide issue, even though I'm a Wisconsinite. I see myself really as a Great Lakes citizen, and I see the water bodies here in a national water context and a global water context, and we'll be talking about 
that more tonight. I think it's important as we get into some of this nitty gritty debates that we just keep in mind, this is a globally significant water body with one fifth of the surface water on the planet. And I think we need to keep that global perspective in mind as we look at some of these more granular issues. Uh, something that uh, the Governor Doyle said in his remarks, and he said he still is concerned that 25 or 40 years out, uh, somewhere in that span that we we are really put to the test on this. And, and uh, I know you, you, you've said that you think the compact for the foreseeable future seems to protect the, the, the Great Lakes Basin from having these withdrawals from other places. But I guess the question I would pose, Peter, is let's say we have, as a result of climate change, we have uh, a, a terrible drought in the Midwest affecting the farm belt in Indiana, affecting the farm belt in Illinois. What kind of pressures will be on the compact then by, what kind of pressures will be applied to the governors of those states to say, we need your help, we're going to lose farmers, we're going to lose um, you know, a, a vital portion of our economy if you don't come to our aid. Is that the, that sort of the, the worst case scenario for the compact? Yeah, certainly that's, a, that's one of the potential worst case scenarios. And um, <clears throat> I think, and the governor touched on this a little bit, but I think it's also important, again, I try to have this sort of big picture, uh, long-term perspective, or try to on this, is that uh, it's a miracle that the compact was adopted. I, I don't think it would ever be adopted today. It just happened to come through at this uh, you know, special time in history, and, you know, and, and we don't get to say this very often, right? So it's a uh, bipartisan, multi-jurisdictional, piece of legislation adopted in the absence of a crisis for future generations. I mean, that combination of words, we just don't use that much, and that really shows how remarkable it is. But I think because it was really targeted at future generations and future scenarios that we can't really anticipate in any great detail, I think that we don't really even know how significantly it could be tested or threatened in the future. But one of those issues, climate change, you know, is a big part of these scenarios that people run through uh, on the Great Lakes Compact, especially a climate change issue that would be impacting citizens of Great Lakes states. Right. Yeah. And there's been some precedent for that uh, under the prior um, water management systems. There was a heavy, heavy drought in uh, the southern Mississippi River watershed in the 1980s. And so the governor of Illinois said, hey, well, why don't we just increase temporarily the Chicago diversion? That didn't go over very well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an example of a Great Lakes governor sort of misinterpreting the history and what the region wants, but also trying to balance the needs of multiple citizens in two different watersheds uh, when one's being stressed. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, you can come up with a lot of potential scenarios. I mean, so, what, so those of you who follow the water issues in the American Southwest, uh, the Colorado River, because of you know, it's basically 17 years of climate change induced drought is really being pushed to the limit right now. Uh, Arizona is sort of like flirting with declaring a water emergency because of the Colorado River situation, which would put fallow all sorts of fields uh, that, um, that Arizona farmers use Colorado River water and, and Central Arizona Project water for. Um, and that'll just sort of leapfrog, you know, these, these various issues. And because one of the things that they'll inevitably do is uh, where else can we go? What else can we do? And then, you know, there's a big debate, which I address in the book, about well, just generally whether the era of long-range large-scale diversions is over or not. And I quote numerous people on both sides of, of that issue. Um, and, you know, and, and so one of the questions is, will desalination and other technologies become cheaper and more feasible, thereby releasing the pressure to move water from one major watershed to another? Um. We've had a couple of moments today where we've talked about uh, both quantity and quality. And I'm wondering what you think of that as an issue going forward, the, the concern about the quality of the water being returned to Lake Michigan. Is that taken on a growing importance in these discussions? Yeah, well, if you, you can have all the quantity you want, but if it's not drinkable, it doesn't really matter, right? If it's not usable by the people and the environment around it. Um, and you know, I, the, bo the book is a water quantity book, and I agree with uh, Dave Ulrich completely that all these issues are 
you know, interrelated, but if I were to interrelate all those issues in one book, it'd be 2,000 pages long and no one would read it. So you gotta kind of strategically pick these different uh, avenues and angles. Uh, but yeah, again, as I mentioned earlier, the microplastics, you know, the pharmaceutical issues, these kinds of things, you know, we're, we're continuing to learn about water quality issues that we didn't even know about a few years ago. And I, again, I think a key issue here is continue to be uh, water technology advancement and development and um, places like Israel where that's a national security issue are really at the forefront of a lot of these developments. Um, maybe a, a final question or so and I'll turn it back over to, to Dave Strifling. Uh, Foxconn and, and the, the, the precedent set there. Uh, you know, Foxconn is, as you point out, one of the world's largest corporations, so it's, it's not a typical example, but does it, does it serve as a possible, uh, does it serve as encouragement for other corporations who say, there's the water, maybe that's something we do, Foxconn has done it, it's gone pretty smoothly in terms of getting access. Uh, does that open the door to other businesses identifying this area and the Great Lakes Basin specifically as a good place to do business? Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, that's what, one of the things that was the idea behind the compact. I mean, the governors wanted companies like Foxconn to come to the Great Lakes Basin and then sustainably and responsibly use that water to create jobs, create a more vibrant economy and culture here. Again, keywords being sustainably, right, and, and uh, in an environmentally sound manner. Um, the only dish issue with Foxconn is that, you know, when they threw the Foxconn dart at the board, it was just a little bit too far to the west uh, for, for it to sort of slip in less controversially. I mean, there's also, of course, the controversies about the, you know, the, the state, $3 billion in state incentives and that kind of a thing. But just speaking it from a water standpoint, that is the kind of thing that the Great Lakes governors we're envisioning with the Great Lakes Compact of this dispute is what's called often the, the blue economy of the Great Lakes region would replace the Rust Belt economy and that water, you know, it is arguably our most valuable long-term uh, natural resource in this region. And uh, it's just that this, this first big case ended up just being a little bit more con convoluted than uh, was, I think, originally anticipated. Um. Quick question. Uh, so you're going to be traveling uh, around the Midwest to talk about this new book. Um, oh. Tell us about your future plans for the next. Uh, yeah, so I have six months. six talks in the next ten days in three different states, and got a, just got an invitation in uh, in San, Santa Fe. So we'll be heading down to the Colorado River, uh, you know, compact area. Talk down there. So. Um, you know, it's just, it's, as we talked on the beginning, to just bring this full circle, I mean, the, the people in the Great Lakes region really have passionate and amazing, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, personal connections with the lakes, and it comes out, and, and uh, it's just, it's fascinating to see the people express themselves in the question and answer period, and just the overall interest there is in keeping the lakes as great as we can. Peter Annan is the author of The Great Lakes Water Wars and, uh, and head of the Innovation Center, Freshwater Innovation Center up at, uh, in Ashland at uh, God, I'm, Northland College. Northland College. Isn't that terrible? Um, <laughs> we appreciate your time today. Thanks very much for being with us. And I'll turn it back over to Dave. <laughs> Thank you for a second time, uh, Peter and Mike. Just. Uh, a minute or so of closing remarks, and then we can get to the lunches. In one sense, 10 years is a long time. Certainly, each one of us can think of things that were different in our own lives a decade ago. And the Great Lakes Compact, too, has seen plenty in its somewhat brief time of existence, from its formation to the early implementation efforts to the controversies over Waukesha and, and now Foxconn. So it's a worthwhile exercise, I think, for us to have reflected on this history, and we've done that. But we've also just begun to explore the promise that the compact may hold over the next decade and beyond. And I hope today, brought together, as Dean Kearney said at the outset, new friends and old, in furtherance of both those past reflections and on future opportunities for collaboration and for cooperation. So for all of us here at the law school, I want to thank Governor Doyle, Peter Annan, 
Dave Ulrich, Shaylee Pfeiffer, Mike Goucher, all of our participants from near and far, our event staff, and of course all of you here today. We wouldn't be able to offer programs like this if there wasn't the interest from you. So please don't forget to take a lunch on your way out. Uh, copies of Peter's book are still available outside as well. And we still have the tables uh, set up out there too. So feel free to stay, continue your conversations, and eat your lunch uh, here in the forum if you like. Thank you again, and I hope to see you all at similar programs in the future.